Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I am in a tree, and you are sitting in the northeast corner of wonderful Safari, watching Safari Live. Yes, still in the tree, everyone. Welcome again. It is a marvellous day here in the Low Felt, and on account of the fact that Brian and I found only some elephants and not much else this morning, I thought I would try and gain some height in order to find whatever it is this wilderness might be hiding for us. You are most welcome. We are on a live safari for the next three hours. Uh, we are called Safari Live, in case you are wondering who we are. My name is James Henry. On camera today is Brian Joubert. And Brian, you have an interesting thumb this afternoon, don't you? What is it? Have a look at this, everybody. And it apparently is a suave, a suave starfish. Of course, they are not found often around here. The echinoderms, the echinoderms normally found in marine environments. But of course, because we are an all-round nature show, we thought we'd have a suave starfish for you today. Uh, please do talk to us during the course of the afternoon. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. You can tweet anything you like. Well, as long as it's not too rude. And questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. You can be much ruder on that, of course, because no one will see it. Other than the ladies in the final control. Which brings me to the ladies in the final control. We have Kirsten McLennan-Smith, who is uh, directing this afternoon. And um, I think it is uh, Rebecca helping her out on the second director's chair. Stefan Winterboer, the mystic boer, will be out on walk later on. And uh, he will also be, well, also driving around, heading hopefully towards those magnificent Nkuhuma cubs. Brent Leo Smith being filmed by the diminutive and Paul Kruger-like figure of Viam Durenbrak. I am now going to exit this tree. I have not seen anything that I wish to show you up here, and I hope that you will shut your eyes should the eventuality of my plummeting down occur. Brian, will you shut your eyes? And you must also administer first aid. No, we'll have to open them once the screaming begins. There we are. It's quite a nice tree, everybody. It's called a weeping wattle. And um, it seems I've been coming across many trees at the moment that are supposed to be good for eye troubles. If you have eye troubles, i.e. dust has got into your eyes, or perhaps the brightness of the sun has rendered your eyes red and sore, well, then you shake, or you don't shake these, you shake these into water, you soak them for a little while, and then you put the cold decoction in your eyes and that will soothe them until they are perfectly white around whatever colour it is you have in the middle. Right, there it is. Uh, we came down this route because we were hoping Tingana the male leopard would be around here. He was in Simbambili, basically over there this morning, but he seems not to have popped across this far. So we're going to do a little drive down the western fringe of Juma, and then we're going to head towards Cheetah Plains, uh, where we're hoping to find something of interest. If nothing else, we'll have a great view down to the south, towards the valley of the Great Sand River. In the meantime, let us go across to Brentleo Smith and find out what it is and where it is that he is going to be operating this afternoon. So, after an incredibly exciting sunrise safari, VM and I are following up again on the Inkahuma Pride, who incredibly in the first ever introduction of three tiny little cubs into the pride and we were there to witness it live um, if you missed it just have a look on our facebook page there's a little highlight reel of what happened this morning but now they're not where we left them which is not unexpected it was quite cool for the morning and the possibility they might have got a fright from the, the males coming in the birmingham boys so I did see one track heading off in a sort of north-westerly direction, which probably makes sense, and they could be going to the Buffleswick Waterhole for a drink. So 
we're going to head now. We're quite close. Oh, hello. Or that's the other option that could have happened to the poor lions. They could have been scattered by the largest African animal, the elephant. So that's quite easily they could have been chased by elephants, and that's why they had to move. Hello, little man. Young elephant bull. Did you go chase the lions, little man? It's looking like he might be alert. Not too alert, though. But he's probably heading down towards the Bukhazok waterhole. Doesn't look like he's had a drink yet today. And he's smelling the ground quite carefully. Could be tracking a larger breeding herd. Hey, mister. So it's not uncommon to find these young bulls, sort of around 20 by themselves, because of all their hormones, and they tend to cause a bit of havoc around the breeding herds, they try to avoid them. Now Cindy, welcome on the sunset safari Cindy. Cindy said, we see lions and leopards mating, why don't we ever see elephants? Well, Cindy, their estrus cycles are, are far more widely spaced out than, the, than the, the, the cats, and also obviously with that very long gestation period of 22 months. He's definitely smelling something, whether he's smelling for more elephants, which is what I think he's doing, rather than smelling for lions. So also, those females are, the female elephants are committed to their youngsters for a lot longer period uh, than the lions. And also, the main reason we don't see as much elephant mating is that uh, the mortality rate of elephants is much, much lower than it is for the cats. So there's a lot more frequent mating because they lose babies more often. I want to let him ponder what he wants to do. I just want to get down to the water hole before he does and if the lions are there before he chases them. So if we don't... Oh, there's more elephants in through the thickets here. So there's a strong possibility that those lions were chased by elephants, which means we've got a challenge. Vim, do you accept the challenge, What's the challenge? of finding the Inkahumas? Yes, yes, if Vim accepts. Anyway. Yes, he was planning on doing it anyway. So there is a strong possibility that, as I said, those lions could have been chased by elephants or got a fright from the males coming in. So the males would have heard that interaction we had uh, with the females and the cubs and uh, they might have been attracted by that sound. So we're going to have a quick look at the waterhole. If there's no sign of tracks or on the waterhole, I'm going to go back to that last position where they were and uh, try to figure out which way the tracks go. So we're about two minutes from a, not even two minutes from approaching the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Lots of sign of elephant activity all around. Hi, Haley. Uh, Haley's wondering if I think there's any particular reason that amber-eyed lioness was the first one to meet the cubs this morning. I think she was the, just happened to be the closest to where the lioness with the cubs was, uh, and, uh, and she was contact calling. So she was making a noise, making her presence known. I think that's probably the reason why, Haley. Now, fingers crossed, there will be now, if eight cubs, so 14 lions, possibly 16 lions in one group if the Birminghams are with them, two Birminghams that were quite close by this morning. I think that will possibly be the biggest group of lions I've seen on Safari Live. There are 16 lions all together. So fingers crossed, are they lounging by the waterhole? I'm not unfortunately seeing any tracks to make me believe so. This is where we found them this morning. Well, the amber-eyed lioness and the female with the cubs. I'm just, just checking carefully. 
I don't see any sign of their tracks coming down this way. So we're going to head back towards where they last were and see if they're not lying up a little bit further in the river system uh, in the shade because of being chased by elephants or maybe something else. A buffalo or a kudu bumbled into them and they went off on the hunt. Uh, we're going to make our way there and while we do that, let's see what the highly entertaining James Henry is up to. I'm deeply injured, everybody, you can see. I've had to use the old term rice first aid training. We've just done it. Rest, ice, compress, elevate. I've just managed to elevate. We don't have any ice with us, everyone. I, I can't push too much pressure on it uh, because it's too painful. That I did while uh, climbing that tree, everyone. These are the sacrifices that Wild Earth makes to bring you the pictures that we do. You can see a very severe injury indeed. Brian, do you, what do you think the prospects of my survival are? Oh, we might have to amputate. We might have to amputate. Uh, do you think that Amputation Live would be a good TV show? Yes. Right. Maybe you and I will be the first to do Amputation Live. Especially as there's not much leg to cut off. Okay. Exactly. We can probably do it with a pair of wire cutters. Okay, we're going to go past Treehouse Dam now, see if Karula is there, and then we're going to head to Cheetah Plains. But before we do that, everybody, in front of us, the most common, and yet one of the most elegant antelope here at Juma. Firstly, we shall frame them underneath the Marula tree so that you might get a sense of the vista. Isn't that nice, Brian? Look how framed they are between the two pillars that are those marula trees. One thinks of heaven's gates when one sees the sky through those two pillars, doesn't one, Brian? And there indeed into the heavens stretches the great low felt atmosphere. Okay, enough of that stupidity. Let's keep going. We'll just get a little bit closer to them. See what they're doing. It's all too tempting sometimes just to go past these things and not observe them because I think that the impala would probably teach us as much, as much about themselves as the leopards would do. The pillars. So we've got a mixed herd of males. I say mixed because they're of mixed ages. And I'll explain how I know that now. Assuming they don't all run off at a great speed. Now, you can see the one there with the horns that are not bent twice. They're only bent once. That's one there, yep. And you can tell when they're born or how old they are quite easily because they're all born in November, you see. Uh, so that chap is coming up now onto his first birthday. Is that correct? No, I imagine he's actually coming up onto his second birthday. It'll be his second birthday this year. See that? The other's at least two and a half or, you know, two and more than three years old. So they'll be coming up to their third or fourth or fifth birthdays. And it's difficult to tell once they're past their second birthday. Brian, they don't seem to want to spend much time with us, so I think we shall continue. Yeah, I think that they're probably quite afraid of the echinoderm that is uh, affixed to your thumb. Yes, they should be. The suave echinoderm. Terrifying creature. Let me see it again. Very nice. Yes. I was asking Brian, I see he said to me, do you want to see the thumb today? So I said, of course I want to see the thumb today. So then I said to him, what is it? Because normally I can tell what it is. I had the same trouble with the tumbleweed from two days ago, but here is a suave starfish. And I was forced to ask Brian how on earth he managed to think of drawing a suave starfish on his thumb in the middle of the low felt. He couldn't come up with an answer. Now, 
Look over there, not for any other reason other than the fact that that milkberry tree sitting on the termite mound is one of Karula's favorite trees. She likes to go and sit there. But you can't see it during the summer. You can't see that tree from the road. It's totally invisible. And yet at this time of the year, it is uh, perfectly visible. Do you see a leopard there, Brian? No. Not currently. That's disappointing. Hello, everybody at the Landstown Teachers Conference. Uh, you're most welcome. I believe you've joined us all the way from Virginia Beach, Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And it'll, it's lovely to have you with us. I hope you enjoy the time that you have with us. And please do talk to us during the next little while that you're with us. Hashtag Safari Live if you want to ask us a question on Twitter. Or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to ask us on the email. Okay, we're looking for leopards, sort of, in this area. Uh, we're not sort of fixated on that outcome. But it would be nice to see Karula, a 12-year-old female leopard who's got two little cubs here. And they are now going to be, they were born on the 2nd of February, so you can work out how old they're going to be. They're going to be ooh, seven months old, fairly soon. Behold, Brian, the lilac-breasted roller. Now, there are two lilac-breasted rollers here. There is the one, and there is another fairly close by. And they are quite possibly a pair thinking about the springtime. Can you see the other one, Brian? And I suspect that they are looking in that dead tree because they like the holes in trees. That's where they nest. And they're indistinguishable, the male from the female. And it's one of the great mysteries, I think of the bush out here. We've had various discussions with our viewers, fascinating discussions, over whether or not... Oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? We've had various discussions about why it is that the males and females should be so brightly coloured, none of which I have found particularly satisfactory. Denise, welcome. Thank you for your question. You say, how often does it rain here? Well, it's easier to say how much rain we get here. We normally get 600 millimetres or two feet of rain, 24 inches or so. That's in a good year. In a bad year, like last year, we had 200 millimetres, which is much less than that. That's a third of the rain that we should have got normally. And that means that the place is pretty dry at the moment. The rain normally starts at the end of November, or the good rains. We probably get a shower or two before then. It will just green up the grass, and the trees here are going to flush with their new leaves, probably from sort of the early September. But that's that's the easiest way for me to sort of... Ooh, she flew straight towards us briefly. That's the easiest way for me to describe it to you, Denise. It's not possible for me to say how often it rains because it is so random. And, you know, you find that just about all over Africa where the weather is almost... Well, it's unpredictable compared with areas, say, of a latitude that uh, fits with... Um, the Mediterranean. So if you think of the Mediterranean Sea and you think of the countries on both sides of the Mediterranean, the climates there are pretty predictable. They, they rain pretty much the same time every year, much less of a gap between high and low, and so the average actually means something. Average rainfall here, really a pretty meaningless concept because it is so very variable. Hello, Eric. Lovely to hear from you again. Thank you very much. You say, how many leopards do we get in the area? Well, it depends what area you mean. In the Sabi Sands itself, that's the 60,000 hectares or so that we're operating on now, there is a record of at least uh, 183 leopards knocking about the place. In this particular area where we are now, well, we see two females regularly, uh, one, in fact, most of the time now, but uh, two or three females regularly, that's Karula, uh, Inkanyeni, or for Cheetah Plains, and Shadow a little bit into um, Arethusa to the west of us, and then we see one or two others now and then, and then we see the cubs of those ones, so Shadow's got one, Karula's got two, uh, Inkanyeni's got two, although we don't see them very often, because Karula's ones form the bulk of our viewing, and then two or three male leopards that are resident territorial males, and then one or two non-resident territorial males. So that's the kind of leopard distribution in this particular area. But the Sabi sand, which forms 60,000 hectares, 
Well, if you multiply that by 2.2 and you get to roughly, uh, say, 140,000 acres, or 2.4, so maybe 160,000 acres, uh, that's the Sabi sand which forms part of the western fringes of the Kruger Park, 183 leopards into the Kruger, of course, because we are connected, there are no fences, 8.5 million acres of land, I don't even want to try and work out how many leopards there must be in that area. No one knows, for sure. Hello Colleen, we are hoping to see some of our, my favourite animals today, those are wild dogs, uh, that's the wolf of Africa, the painted wolf of Africa, I think my most favourite, mainly because they are so entertaining to watch hunt, to watch play, and of course because they have a very egalitarian society, uh, to which many humans aspire of course. Now, my second favourite animal out here at the moment is what you're going to see with Brent Leo Smith right now. go we are with some little lion cubs now this is the Inkahuma pride of cubs there are five older ones but very similar in age but from two different litters and for the first time the three smallest cub members were introduced to them on the sunrise safari and there to the right you can see the little one a little bit to the left there is it oh there it is you can just see it moving through the bush we're not getting too close because none of the females are here. So what's happened is they've left all the cubs together in a relatively inaccessible area and they've gone off hunting. Something might have stumbled through to them and they've gone off hunting and left all the cubs together. This is very normal behavior for lions because cubs quite often ruin the hunt. So we've stopped quite far away from them and we're just it's going to sit quietly. They quite often will come closer to us if they get curious. But what we're really hoping is that the females are going to return. Hey little guys. So there are eight cubs in total, although we can only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think I, if we move a little bit we might be able to see all eight. Oh no, they're going to... They're going to crawl out to the open, the smallest ones. Now they're having a little bonding session behind the bush. I'm going to move the car ever so slightly. And remember, we're on a live African safari. Send your questions through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safarilive on Twitter. Isn't this just too exciting? I said we're going to keep a little bit of distance. Hi, Andrew. Andrew is from the Lansdowne Teachers Conference and is wondering what are some of the more rare animals we get to see on safari? Well, we have seen pangolin, which is a form of scaly anteater. Um, serval, which is another type of wild cat. I'm just concentrating on driving. Oh, there we go. So it's very important when you're around animals, and specifically young animals, to drive very carefully and very considerately. We don't want them to have any negative connotations with the vehicles. So that's why I'm very measured and quiet when I move. Even though the car might sound loud, they are quite used to them. And we want to get them very used to them. There we go. There, the little, little ones at the back. Now, Caroline is wondering, do all eight cubs belong to the same lioness? Not at all, Caroline. So we've got three different litters here. So two, uh, the, the five older cubs are from two females. Uh, one female had three cubs, the other had two. And then the three smallest, tiniest little ones, those are from uh, a third female. So there's three different litters. Now, lions generally produce between two and four cubs. They're the smallest ones, or two of them at least. There could be a third, they could be in a lion pile. Now, 
normally in the wild two to four cubs per lioness uh, but in the wild the largest recorded ever uh, litter was about, was six uh, six little lions but in captivity there have been over 10 recorded but that is very abnormal hi eric now eric would like to know what is the chances or how many of these cubs will survive um well with the little lion cubs they have about a 60, 60 to 70 percent mortality rate so more than likely the majority of these cubs will not make it through to adulthood and about 70 percent of all lion cub mortalities are not caused by other predators like hyenas or leopards but they are actually caused by other lions uh, specifically nomadic males or new pride males coming in here we go we can see the age difference there so the smallest ones are about eight or nine weeks old and the bigger ones are about 16 weeks now if the Inkahuma pride which is our dominant female pride is lucky enough to raise the majority of these to adulthood the pride will be looking very very good because as far as we know we're not a hundred percent sure yet but there are only two or three young males so the majority of females and add to the five adult females already that would put this pride at over 10 adult females which is a really large pride for this part of the world now of course we're all hoping that they are successful in raising this lot of ruffians to adulthood because it will be incredible to follow this pride as they become a much bigger pride and start and start taking down bigger prey. Hi Sarah. Now Sarah is wondering what age do the lion cubs begin to eat meat? At about between six to eight weeks, Sarah. So they, they're very at a very early age they're already on a meat diet, but obviously coupled with mother's milk and uh, they are weaned at around six months and it's also when they lose their milk teeth and their adult teeth come through. But lions, being the only social cat, practice some, something that's quite incredible in the animal kingdom. It's called allosuckling, which means, in this case, with three lionesses with cubs that are all, all still on milk, that all of those lionesses will happily suckle uh, cubs that are not their own. So it is one of the benefits of being a social predator and having multiple lactating females at the same time. Now there's some very interesting research that's being done at the moment uh, to see if lion prides or females in the lion prides coincide their estrus cycles uh, to take advantage of aloe suckling. Of course, we've just mentioned that these little guys have about a 70% mortality rate. And Caroline is wondering, what are the predators of little lion cubs? As I said, 70% of the mortalities are due to other lions. But also, hyena will play a role, leopard. Uh, in certain cases, jackal, python have been known to eat little lion cubs as well, big snakes. Uh, even large birds of prey, such as our martial eagle, which has got a wingspan of uh, just under nine feet are capable of taking a little lion cub and in, in extremely rare cases a buffalo if they smell a lion den or lion cub will try stampede and step on the future or the future harasses of them Hey, little guys. Now, but we're having such a high mortality rate. They have a very short uh, gestation period, only about 110 days. And if any of the cubs are lost, those females will almost immediately come back into estrus and start breeding to produce another litter. 
Are we going to sit quietly next to these little lions? Oh, let's just see what... <laughs> Hello, cousin. Maybe the novelty of new cousins hasn't quite worn off yet. But while they go down to sleep for a little bit, uh, we've got Stefan, who's out on bushwalk. Good afternoon, and that's exactly right. My name is Steph, and I am on the bushwalk session of this particular afternoon. And good afternoon it is to all of you. We've got Xander on the camera again, and we are sitting in a drainage line quite close to camp. And I must say, it brings me such pleasure to see something here. It's for something for my imagination to picture while I'm busy sitting in the sand and just realizing what's happened. Last night, a big male leopard walked exactly where I'm sitting. And although this track is indistinct, leopards like this, Whole territories in the Sabi Sands that are relatively big. We're looking at anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 hectare. A hectare is about 100 yards by 100 yards big, a square. 3,000 to 5,000 hectare big is quite a big area for these very elusive cats to roam in and to have their territories in. They're highly territorial like lions. Only one male leopard will be in this particular area and he'll have to fight out all other rival males into areas around him. And this particular male is a full grown male and I know because of the size of this track. He has the back of the track. And let me take a piece of grass I can show you. He has the back of the track, three very distinct lobes. And here are the toes. That one's covered by some grass. There's one and there's one. And there's one. If I take my fist and I put it into the track, it fits almost exactly the size of that track. And that's how I know it's a big male leopard. They have a board that's as long as my fist. A female will be about that size over there, quite a lot smaller than a male. Let's see if we can walk with this leopard. If you come down to about my head level, that's the head level of this cat, and he would have been slinking up this draw and you can see why he used this particular ravine it's offering him some nice cover to hunt the fringes of this particular grassland and what he'd be hunting for is bushbuck nyala baby kudu and impala steenbuck or daker they all and do all live in this particular area and this is what this male, this male leopard would have done he would have stepped here he stepped again here and let's see if we can follow it footstep for footstep to see where you would walk if you were a male leopard. So Chrissy, hello Chrissy, you've quite, you've quite rightly surmised that we're in the middle of a drought. It is quite dry at the moment. It's the biggest drought in living memory. I have heard Brent say that it's the biggest drought since the, the early 90s somehow. He obviously knows a fact that I don't. I'm sure that he's found out some more information. He's a bit of a bookworm old Brent, but absolutely. We're in a very, very dry time, drier than usual, except for one thing. October, September usually looks like this. We only know that it's dry because we've been living in such dry conditions for the last couple of months. But generally speaking, any time you come to Africa during these couple of months, this is what you're going to be seeing. It's quite a low rainfall area, this Chrissy. We only receive around about 400 millimeters of rain in a year, and 400 millimeters of rain is about that much. Just two of my hands of rain a year. Whereas in most other places in the world, much more than this, or wetter places in the world, much, much more like this. All right, let's see if we can picture where this particular male leopard walked. We can absolutely see, here's one of his tracks. I'm gonna put you down at his head level. Let's see if we can get you through this draw. Have a look at that. Now you are going to have to walk above here onto the bank with Xander while I try and see if I can picture in my mind where this particular leopard walked. But he walked right here and here and I can confirm that with another track. You're just going to go up onto the bank quickly and then you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about here. 
right here we've got another one of the tracks of this particular male leopard and I can almost in my mind how we track is we've got to put ourselves into the mind of these animals and it's the only way that we get to find him. He walked here and he stepped up on top of this bank then he walked here you can see where his toes have crushed a little bit of the sand and he's gone up onto this. Now it was dark when he walked here but nevertheless that is where he's gone and that's where we are going to go and look for some more of his tracks and while we do and while we cross across this open area to see if we can find some more of his tracks we're going to send you over to James who's got an update for you. That is a Natal Spurfowl everybody and it is so identified by its orange pink legs they're quite magnificent aren't they Brian he looks like he's got a pair of stockings on and a similarly colored bottom mandible i.e. bottom part of the beak he's rather a splendid fellow now all of these Franklins we get five species here the Natal Spurfowl or Franklin the Swainsons the Crested the Shelleys and the Koki all of them superficially very nondescript and not much to look at but when you get up close like we are now, where if that thing would step out from behind its tussock, there we are, you can see amazing details, incredible colours, and I think they're just rather splendid birds. And they occur in a collective called a covey. So this is a covey, and unfortunately that is a hunting term, so if you're of the propensity where you like to blast these things out of the sky with a shotgun, not a propensity I understand myself, uh, well then you might call them a covey. Hello Mary, a very common query about what we do out here, you say have I ever been hurt by an animal out on safari? Mary I have not ever been hurt by an animal on safari, I've been one or two times when I thought I might be uh, but no, I haven't ever been hurt. The worst hurt that I've had from an animal on safari was from a tick bite. Uh, they subjected my inner thigh once to a very severe mauling. Uh, it was very unpleasant, and I still have a very small scar to show for it. But Mary, otherwise, you're pretty safe out here, you know, unless you behave in a manner that is not very sensible, uh, you're safe. We know how the animals behave out here. We understand their behavior to a large extent and so we watch their behavior very carefully and in so doing we reduce any potential conflict that there might be by keeping our distance when animals indicate that we are not comfortable with their presence. And so we stay in a position where the animals never feel cornered. And remember, an animal out here will only ever attack you if it feels so cornered that it has no other option but to attack in order to make you go away. So none of the animals out here are inherently dangerous. They're not inherently aggressive at all. And it's completely unlike a situation, for example, that you might have with a bear, say a grizzly bear or a polar bear. I think they're the same species, actually which didn't evolve with human beings and therefore they see us kind of more or less as fair game. All of the African animals out here don't see us as that in that way. They see us with the notable exception of a crocodile which is substantially older than the mammals out here. They don't see us as prey, they see us as a predator and that's what makes this a lot safer than you might think it would be because we can park next to lions. We've just been with Brent who's sitting with lions and we will see elephants and we see all, all sorts of other animals like that and they just don't see us as a threat. All right, teachers at Lansdowne, I hope you had a good, uh, well, it was a very short safari. You must try and uh, speak to the powers that be so that you might come on a longer safari with us next time. Have a good day. Uh, we're going to continue towards Cheetah Plains and see what we can find over there. But for the rest of you, we're still with you. Let's carry on from our little covey of Natal Spurfowl. Now, um, just quite an interesting update for coming in from Biffle's Hook, uh, which is the property to the north of us. <laughs> uh, many of you will know that the old dog Mvula has been mating with Shuluva, and they have managed to kill one impala each, and they're eating separately at the moment in two different trees, not too far from the boundary. So that's, <laughs> that's quite impressive, I think. 
hungry work mating if you're a leopard. Normally the male will just steal his meal from the female if he can, on account of the fact that he's bigger than she is. Hold on, Brian. Well done. Now that last time Karula was seen, she was crossing this road here, going down to the south. Uh, but while Steph is out on bushwalk, let's go and get an update on some of the smaller things from him. And you catch myself and Xander actually walking across this big open plain. This is quarantine clearings. And that big male leopard that we were showing you the tracks of came across here somewhere. Now rather than follow footstep for footstep, which will waste an inappropriate amount of time and be very, very boring for you to watch, we've decided to try and skip ahead to a place where I think it's most likely that he'll come out. Now, one of the things that is racing through my mind is he's probably having walked from one ravine, he's going to want to walk to another ravine. And I, once again, I stand to be corrected from Brent, he is an absolute master at following these things. There's a ravine right here in front of us, and I think that there's a good chance that in that line of bush that you see in front of you there, that we, on a game path, are gonna pick up the tracks of this male leopard. But while we're doing it, it gives us a nice, oops, falling over the stick, it gives us a nice opportunity to catch up about, in particular, this drought, which, as you can see, it has had an absolutely devastating effect on the grass at our feet, to a point where I don't actually think there's much of anything. We had a little bit of rain, and that's given us a little bit of this grass, literally just these tufts that have come out, some rain that came in with a cold front, I think now probably close to about two weeks ago. And this will burn off probably within the next week or two, or be eaten, one of the two. And then we normally get rain here around about... We get a little spatter around about the 1st to the 2nd of September, which for us is our spring day. And then we get our first big rains. And by big rains, we're talking about the first 20 mils or so, which is that much water. We get our first 20 millimeters or so uh, around about the 10th to the 15th of October. Local folklore definitely says that if it rains before the 10th of October, by a week we're going to have an incredibly wet year. If it rains a week after the 10th of October, so around about the 17th of October, then we're going to have a very dry year. There's so many trains of thought at the moment. We were talking this morning, Brent was talking this morning about the El Nino, or I think it was James, I think, the El Nino effect, or El La Nina, which is the opposite of what we've just had right now. We're expecting a fairly wet year. However, I think we'll put my prediction on rain around the 10th of October to the test and we'll see whether it rains before or after the 10th of October. Absolutely. All right, let's carry on here and see. Let's see if we can find anything interesting in this fallen down leadwood. Now, leadwoods that fall down like this make homes for very many animals. And the reason for that is that the wood itself is almost impervious to termites. It's a very, very hard wood, very dense. You're looking at about just less than one and a half tons per cubic meter, which is an incredibly dense wood. It's in actual fact the third densest wood that we have here. And the heaviest tree that we get here is this leadwood. They have a sap on the inside of their bark, which insects from all over love to come to and that is exactly what I'm looking for now is a thing called a sap run. When a branch, when one of these hard trees creaks in the wind or has been pushed over like an elephant has pushed over this one, the bark tears slightly and the sap leaks out and insects come and feed on that particular sap. Not only insects, I mean almost everything from antelope all the way through to humans will actually eat this particular sap. It's quite nice. has a sweetish taste if you haven't already developed a sweet tooth for anything. Um, and basically it's just like crystallized sweet. But I think while we stick our noses into this tree and try and discover something of interest for you, those little cubs are just too cute to keep you away from. So we're still with the wonderful little 
Inkahuma cubs and they are just too precious so they're in a really good spot the lionesses have chosen a wonderful place to leave them so they are lying up on the edge of the drainage line that's not uncommon but just below them is a very deep little ravine that uh, I think even most other predators would battle to get into it's also covered by a massive fallen thorn tree so a really good little hiding hole for the cubs if they feel threatened or anything gives them a fright they're going to immediately scuttle into that area now what we're doing now because the adult females are not here and because of all the pandemonium from this morning although it looks like those little ones have been completely accepted now and so all the pandemonium from this morning we are keeping this to a one vehicle sighting so we're not going to be able to stay too long and uh, we're going to leave them if the females were here, it would be a very different story. And uh, we're probably going to zone this area quite early unless the lionesses arrive. We want to give these little Inkahumas the best chance of making it to adulthood. I've got a good feeling about these cubs. I think they're going to break the, the normal 70% mortality rate. So fingers crossed, send them all goodwill. And remember... This is live if anyone is new and you can send a question through to me by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send me an email questions at wildearth.tv. Isn't this absolutely splendid? So incredibly special to, to have a little delve into these amazing animals. Now, we've talked about how, how high the mortality rates are for little lions, and Richard in British Columbia is saying, how risky is it uh, for a lioness to defend her cubs against nomadic male lions? It's very risky, uh, Richard, and the Nkuma Pride suffered that last year when defending those two young females and junior from the now dominant Birmingham boys. Three Nkuma lions, or two adults in Nkuma, Actually, no, it was three adult in Kahuma lionesses and one of the sub-adult females were killed in that defense. So it is, it is very risky. And it all depends on the exact situation. Sometimes uh, the lionesses will even sacrifice the cubs so they can survive. Other times they will try fight to the death. But with nomadic or, or, or dispersal males coming in, it is an incredible risk. Brenda's wondering, do any of these cubs have the amber eye gene? Uh, not that I've noticed. None of them actually belong to amber eyes herself. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a recessive gene that's carried in all the Nkahuma females. Uh, I think we're going to have to wait for them to get a bit older before we can say for sure, Brenda. Okay, well... The lion cubs are settled down, they all snoozing peacefully. We're going to have to leave shortly. Now, Lynn has proposed a very interesting question. Uh, is it possible if the Inkahuma cubs and the Styx cubs, specifically the males, reached maturity, could they form a coalition? It is possible, but incredibly unlikely. Now, the main reason for that being there are six sticks, young males. So six of them together, there's no reason for them to take on any outside help. As far as I can see, there's only two young males in Kahuma, so they might join up with another single nomad or another two single nomads. But for the sticks, young males, it makes absolutely no sense to take on anyone else when there's already six of you who know each other intimately and that if they do survive through to adulthood is the potential for another monster Sabi Sands male lion coalition. Okay well the cubs are all snoozing so we're going to sneak out and let them sleep away hopefully we'll hear if the mothers and aunties come back later what we're going to try to do is actually go have a look for the adult lionesses now 
There's no tracks heading towards Biffles Hook, so I think they might have gone down towards the southeast. So fingers crossed, who knows? Maybe we'll find them on a kill. While we do that, let's go back to Steph, who's marching around on foot. Now this is such a most interesting find. This here is a gall that I've just picked off of a terminalia bush. And inside the gall was a tiny little hole. Inside the hole was a tiny little web. And inside the web was a tiny little wasp. Have a look there. Ooh. And I think what we're having a look at there is an immature gall wasp. Isn't that amazing? I've never actually seen one before. I don't know if it is or it isn't, to be honest with you. All I'm basing it on is the fact that this was inside that cocoon, silky cocoon. The cocoon was inside this gall, and the gall was inside or on top of a terminalia that is very, very common for having galls. There's what it looked like, basically. I have lost a little bit of the gall. But as you can quite clearly see, the wasp itself looks dead. And that's because I think it's been parasitized or is in the process of being parasitized by one of these little wasp predators. Now, wasps, all their larvae, all a wasp's larvae is, is carnivorous. Wasps themselves are nectivores. They, they drink nectar or they suck on fruit sap. But a wasp needs to feed its larvae. It needs to feed it live prey. And what some wasps do is they lay their eggs onto the bodies of other wasps. The larvae then hatches and crawls into the wasp's body and then eats the wasp out from the inside out. Can you believe it? Making use of the home of, the, of its food, basically its prey species really. And that way one wasp stung the tree creating the gall, created a perfect nesting place for its egg and its larvae. It was then in turn parasitized and then from there the other wasp has either left or is in the process of leaving. I can't really see. I can't see that this wasp has any insides. It's all soft and hollow. But there you have it, an unknown. Inside here, inside there. And then I found it on this tree. This is an immature terminalia. I'm gonna put it back there so we don't waste anything. I love these little explorations that we do. Ah, and one of the perennial questions that comes out on this walk is what's happened to that clay pot? Well, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, and this comes from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, I think is exactly what the Twitter handle is that was in my ear there for a second. Um, we, on, the, on a walk a few months ago, climbed on top of a termite mound escaping some buffalo, and we, at our feet, found a remnant of a clay pot. At the time, I thought that the clay pot was a treasure pot, but in actual fact, it could have been a burial pot from people that used to live here. Could have been as much as 800 years ago, although the estimates are slightly younger than that, to appease the, the ancestors. Pots like this would be ritually placed in a termite mound with an offering of beer to appease ancestors. That's one reason. Or it's a, a, a form of banking. It's an early form of a safety deposit box. A person would put into this pot some of their most prized valuables. It doesn't necessarily have to be gold and jewels and silver. It could have just been anything that was prized or treasured. Buried in the termite mound, the activity at the, at the termite mound would have caused the termites to bury the pot and only that person would know where that pot is. Now what could happen is that person passes away or moves away from the area and doesn't take their pot with. And rain and animals uncover these pots from time to time. And in all the years I've been in the bush, this is now my 18th year or 17th year, um, I've never managed to find one. I've just heard about these pots. We found one. Don't quite know what it is just yet. We're still waiting for the owner of this reserve and the elders of this particular um, of this particular property to walk together to that pot to tell us if it's a burial pot or if it's a treasure pot, and then we'll make a decision from there, which I'm hoping to share with everybody when we do. But 
on that note, and thank you very much for reminding me about just keeping everyone abreast of what's going on there. We're going to be going through to, I think, James, or it could be Brent. I'm not too sure. I didn't quite hear that while I was droning on at you about the pot. But anyway, see you in a bit. <laughs> We've come to an impala sighting, which is our second impala sighting of the day. And it's interesting because there was a male chasing a female here and we can't, there, he's going again. He's just to the left there, Brian. He's starting to chase another, well, there we go. Watch that. Now this might strike the more knowledgeable of you as strange, given the fact that in May, they're supposed to have all been impregnated. The rut should be finished and that's that. Now, the little-known fact, which I've told many of you, and so therefore to many of you, it isn't little-known at all, but uh, widely known, is that in September there is a secondary mating season for those females who did not get pregnant in May. Now, what I think is going on here is that there are one or two ewes in this herd that are perhaps coming into estrus, and they are inspiring a great testosterone fueled chasing match from this ram is quite interesting. You may also hear the gentle flow of water that seems to be coming from a burst pipe in the road. That's not a sort of drought sound you normally hear. Isn't that nice? Here we go. Let's see what he does here. He's chasing her now. And what he's doing is he's just trying to herd them into the, well, into, this, into the group, make sure they're in the group. And I think the action of this chasing, this constant attention, eventually causes them to ovulate. Or certainly helps in that process. I don't know how exactly. But it also helps them to pick a mate who is both virile and able to hold a territory. So he's got good genes. It's a good way for them to select a strong male. Yeah, he's chasing a few of them around. Now, they are brought, let me just reverse back a little bit. They're brought into estrus by changing day length normally. And likewise, the male's testosterone levels are, as the day length changes towards May, I suspect there's an element of that happening here. But I also think that if one or two of these females are coming into estrus, then what's going to happen is that will inspire some kind of sort of testosterone fueled or testosterone um, augmentation, if you like, in the rams. So that's quite interesting. I've only seen them mate in September. I've never seen them during mating during the main phase of the mating. That's in May. And that's because it normally happens at night. But this one, if we're very lucky, we'll see it in the middle of the day. It's an extremely, if you've ever watched leopards or lions mate, the effort that an impala makes is substantially less impressive. It takes about two and a half seconds. interesting. Nina, you're in Spain, you were born in Croatia and you're about to move to KwaZulu-Natal, which is in South Africa. Now that sounds like a fascinating life, kid. You want to know if you buy a piece of land on the borders of the Kruger National Park, will the fences automatically be dropped so that you might enjoy the, uh, the animals of the Kruger Park? Um, in principle, yes. The chances of you getting a piece of land on the, size, on the side of the Kruger National Park that actually borders the fence are negligible to zero. And the reason for that is that all of the land bordering the Kruger Park now is tribal trust land. That means it's held in trust by the government uh, for communities of people, indigenous people that live on the borders of the park. So none of it is actually privately owned. And so you can't buy land on the side of the Kruger Park. You can buy it in places like where Brent's dad lives, uh, close to the Kruger Park, um, but it's, it is slightly separated. So the game estates have got amazing animals in these places but they're not actually connected to the Kruger. Your other option, of course, is to buy one of the lodges around here. Um, that is going to cost you some long sheets, but it's possible. And then you will have animals on your, bed, on your doorstep. But actually buying a piece of land on the Kruger 
very difficult. There are places uh, like in the south of the Kruger, there's a place called Marloth Park and there are a couple of places like that which are sort of share block areas where you can't drive into the park but there is no fence stopping animals coming into the area. It's a sort of very small um, hectare sized, uh, you know, sort of two and a half acres each plots. Uh, and you can see the houses in and around there, but the animals can come in there if they want to come in there. And those are quite nice places to go, and they're quite close access to the parks. And then also, um, there are places in like Timbavati, which is sort of like the Sabi Sands, which are also share blocks where you get a little piece of land and you can come in as often as you like. Uh, but you can't really live there. You're not allowed to live there permanently. And the same goes for a place like Biffles Hook. So that's the sort of option. But to buy Greenfields land on the western fringes of the Kruger, you know, highly unlikely. In Mozambique, you might be lucky. You can't buy land there, but you can certainly get a 99-year lease if you know who to talk to. Nina, that's a nice question. Let us know when you're here from KwaZulu Natal. Let's go back across to Brent, find out what's going on with those lions. I'm going to check where these little lion cubs were yesterday on Cheetah Plains and I'll tell you what happens afterwards. After. So as I said, we're le we've left those little Nkuma cubs. I'm now looking for the adults, the five adult lioness. Now, very interesting, I had a chat to Quivis, who's from Buffles Hook, who was there after after the end of the sunrise safari. And what happened, a big troop of baboons came in and the lionesses ran and chased them. And uh, the baboon barking sent all those little lion cubs scuttling into that little ravine I was talking about. So he, he was very relieved to hear that all were present and accounted for. So the lionesses might have chased those baboons quite far because of the cubs. I've seen the baboon tracks going off there, but they're walking, they're not running. So we're gonna do another big loop back down towards uh, the the north just make sure there are no tracks around cheetah cut line there were lots of zebra in this area this morning and vm and i did see a bat a battalier take off out of a block and at the time we thought maybe the lions have made a kill but we weren't sure and we wanted to go around and check the water so we might go back to that area and have another look there but it is turning into an absolutely beautiful winter's evening and as you can see there's some cloud around, but the, the sun is beating it out as we currently speak. Chitra in India is wondering Will the, other, the cubs run away from each other? As sometimes they do, especially if there's a, a big pandemonium, uh, but they will just basically run to the, the closest, darkest, safest place. And quite often that they all run together, but sometimes they will get separated and run to different places. So we're looking carefully now. Now this is an area where there were lots of zebra this morning. Now of course, the two Birmingham boys were not far into Torchwood here and they were heading generally to the west onto Juma. So maybe we'll find a big male lion tracks coming across as well. Especially if they manage to catch something. Now, so far all I can see is zebra tracks. So we're gonna keep moving. But of course, one must remember, it's not all about the lions and the leopards and the elephants of course they are so wonderful but we are surrounded by amazing and interesting things everywhere so we can do it as a test and we'll do a test a little bit later but first speaking about some of the smaller more interesting stuff let's see what steph's found on bushwalk Yes, we found this apple leaf tree. It's a youngish tree that has been knocked over by elephants. You can see it was pretty much just snapped at this sort of head height that I'm at at the moment. I know it's an apple leaf tree because the leaves, shaped like this, give the most pleasant crunchy noise. And I'm going to see if I can hold it up to my microphone. Listen carefully, listen. There we go. 
go. Sounds like a crunching apple. Apple leaf tree. But not only that, I'm going to try and see if I can show you something that I learned from the Bushmen in the Kalahari. Apple leaf trees make fantastic utensil trees. And right here is what they look for. They look for a piece of wood that's got this grain that goes around in a circle like this. But then what they do is they pick off the piece that they want to use. Now, of course, this is going to prove, let me put down the sharp implement <laughs> before I impale myself. So basically, they peel the bark off like this. Let's see if I can get it right. And then, using a knife and a scraper, they, and always away from you folks, never cut anything towards yourself as your dads and moms used to tell you. You now fashion with the grain of the wood, as you can see it's coming off quite nicely. And let me see if I can get the shape here for you before you get taken away. This is the beginnings of, I'm just going to try and get it rounded there for you, a spoon. Now of course it's going to take me a bit of time to get the handle right and get the shape right, but you can see the spoon-esque shape. And apple leaf makes for a fantastic utensil wood because it doesn't splinter. Now it doesn't look like that from here, but in actual fact these splinters that you see you can rub your hand across them. They don't they don't splinter whatsoever. I mean that's on my lip. I don't really have lips like a giraffe. But <laughs> there you go you can see that it's not splintering at all on a piece of wood that makes it look like a splinter. And basically what I'm going to carry on doing I should be using a bigger knife for this to be honest, but nevertheless, away from my handle, or away, sorry, excuse me, to the handle, but away from the utensil part. I'm just trying to get it as smooth as I can for you. See if I can get this end piece done for you. Should be using a bigger knife than this puny little one that I've got here, but nevertheless. You can start to see the makings of a fine spoon coming out here. Now what I'll do is I'll just gently shape it, probably making it smaller from this end, but I think while I carry on with this, trying to get it as nice as I can for you in the time that I'm allowed, I'm going to send you over to James and we'll come back with the spoon once we're a little bit done. <laughs> Can't wait to find out what he's going to eat with that spoon. Ooh. I nearly ate that tree by mistake. I wish I let my heart rate go down a little bit there. Okay, good. Now, we're heading towards three in a row pan, where hopefully we will find something interesting. Uh, maybe some elephants. It hasn't been a very hot day. I'm still keeping my eye to the sky to see if we can't spot the first Wahlberg's eagle. There isn't a Wahlberg's eagle there, but just watch this female battalier hanging beneath these beautiful grey and white fluffy clouds hanging on the southeasterly breeze. Isn't that amazing? Oh, wow. Brian, much easier than the red-breasted swallow I made you do today. Look at that.
And look at the slight adjustments it's making all the time. Little changes, slight changes to stop it plummeting out of the sky. And all done, each feather at the end of the wings is alternating a position all the time. Oh, it's wonderful. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Hmm. <laughs> I'm still wondering what Steph's going to eat with his spoon. <laughs> Hello Jennifer in San Francisco, you're saying you're a little confused because we keep saying there aren't any fences into the Kruger Park and then we say that there are. Jennifer, please do not be confused. I apologize for making you confused. Uh, what I mean is there are no fences between the Kruger Park proper, the national park, and then this collection of private reserves here, which is called the Sabi Sand, and the collection of private reserves that is the Timbavati, and then there's some uh, locally, provincially owned parks uh, known uh, as Lataba Ranch further north of us, and one called Makoya, even further north of that. And there's also the Manuleti. There is no fence between the national park and those parks. But on the far western boundary, of this, of Makuya, of Lataba Ranch, of Sabi Sands, of Timbavati, there is a fence. And that separates this wildlife land, which is largely privately owned, from the community or villages that live on the western sides. So there is a far western fence, but there is no fence between the Kruger and us. So I, I hope that makes sense. I can try and draw it for you if you like. Um, I'm not a very good artist, uh, but if we might find a good sandy patch of land, I will draw it for you, and then your confusion will hopefully be less, although my drawing is so appalling that your confusion might in fact be worse. So that's the story there. There's such beautiful light here this afternoon, everyone, on account of these clouds that are diffusing the light. I think it's just too stunning for words. Now I'm following the same route that Eggsy and I followed last time. Ooh. No. All right, Tiki, you're in Maryland. I'm going to have to start drawing some pictures, Brian. Um, this looks like a good spot, don't you think? All right, I will draw you a picture, Tiki, of where the territories are and where they fit. And this will hopefully also help with our question about the borders. Okay. If Kirsten needs to link away to something very exciting, uh, she will just do so, and you won't know about it until you're with that exciting thing. Okay, now, I apologize in advance, as I have many times before, because I'm a terrible artist. The first thing we'll do is the Kruger. And the Kruger, we, you're going to pretend that north is this way. You can see this line, can you, Brian? Right, that is south, this is north. Okay, the Kruger Park looked something like this. There's a bit of a boot down the way, and that's what it looks like. Okay, super. That is the Kruger National Park, okay? We sit in a place called the Sabi Sands, which basically sits there like that, on the borders of the Kruger. The Manuleti is there, the Timbavati is here, or the Associated Private Nature Reserves. There are a couple of other of these kind of things as you go up towards the north. Now, um, what was I going to say? There is no fence here on the west of the Kruger. You see where I'm drawing there, Brian? You're losing audio. Let me move it around. How's that? Good. Then, there is a fence along this western boundary here, okay? And all over here are villages. Here is a village. There's a hut in which people live, okay? About four million people living on the borders of the park here. So that's how that works. Now, 
if I am to just change the scale slightly and I'll draw Jum or the northern Sabi sands and then I'll explain the territories very quickly to you. Okay, um, so we're onto a new map everybody, we've zoomed in. And Juma, or the northern Sabi sands, there's a Gari gate. There's the Buffles hook sort of cut line. There's Buffles hook. Okay, like that. Juma, or Vuyatela, is this piece here. Torchwood is this piece here. It's actually a bit longer than that. Torchwood is that bit there. Okay. Arethusa is here. Simbambili is here, which you've heard about often. Uh, Arethusa is probably a bit longer than that. That's basically how it works. Okay. But what you need to know, oh, Cheetah Plains, of course. That's where we are now. That's in Coral. There's Cheetah Plains. Okay. That's Cheetah Plains. So we operate here. Cheetah Plains, Juma, and Arethusa. The Unkohuma Pride's territory looks like this. So it goes all the way through Juma, into Arethusa, into Simbambili, throughout most of Biffle's Hook, and that's and into Torchwood. So that's the Unkohuma Pride. The Styx Pride does border on them. They sometimes come north into Juma. They spend a lot of time on um, Cheetah Plains here, and they go into Mala Mala to the south here, and up into the bottom reaches of Arethusa. Nkahuma sticks. Thank you very much. On we go. Thank you. <laughs> Did that make any sense from where you were sitting, Brian? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. That's good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I just had an update that Rebecca had to leave uh, the final control because of the scraping sound on the sand. I have to have a very strong word with her when I get home. Okay. Brent apparently has got something to show you. Let's go across to him. We'll head to the waterhole. A beautiful big waterbuck bull. Quite close to the Buffles Hook waterhole. And we just noticed the movement as we were crossing along the eastern side. We're still searching for the Nkuma lionesses, but of course the wonderful thing about being in the bush is that there's so many different creatures that can divert your attention. So I just need to talk on the game drop. Copy, no problem. Enjoy. Look at that. Now a big, big waterbuck bull, and it's quite an important animal. Well, let me just go forward a bit. If you live in the part of the world we do, and for the main reason is that a waterbuck, a male waterbuck, is the emblem of the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. There you go. Now, waterbuck are quite often found around water holes and river systems, but not necessarily always so. You can find them all through the bush. And the reason they got the name Waterbuck was around the larger, sort of famous game viewing areas of Africa where there are large rivers like the Zambezi, the Okavango, the Luangwa, the Linyanti, the Chobi. When pursued by lions, and they tend to seek refuge in water. Now, they are part of the Cobus family, or Cobb family, and a lot of the Cobus family are indeed aquatic antelopes, such as Lechwe and Puku. I'm going to let that beautiful big boy carry on munching as he moves through the bush. 
I'm going to show you something. It's, it's quite amazing. We often take it for granted. So let's just go have a closer look at the Buffles Hook waterhole. And it obviously has had a bit of remodeling. But it is one of those, for me, personally, one of the most beautiful things. It's also quite a harsh thing. But I spent from about 11, 12 years old growing up in northern Botswana uh, where dryness is just part and part of nature. And if we look carefully at the cracks that are formed as the water holes dry up, for me it always reminds me of one of my favorite places in Africa, which is the Mkhadi Khadi salt pan, which is a salt pan the size of Switzerland. Oh, there we go. Now, Vim, I've spotted something very interesting which makes a lot of sense. This morning, those blacksmith lapwings when we were with uh, the lions on the other side of the dam were very upset and they were constantly tinking at us now I've just noticed why and I couldn't see this morning because I think I was too focused on the lions but look at this little lapwing the one that's out on the mud there now look underneath there's a baby a tiny tiny little baby lapwing that she's shielding at the moment under her breast now, isn't that absolutely incredible? Now, so that little baby lapwing, when the adults were running around, making lots of noise, trying to attract the lion's attention, trying to attract our attention, we didn't even notice that baby. That baby would have been lying completely still, somewhere very close to where those adults were. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so upset. You just try to reverse a little bit, see if we can get a view underneath her or him. So both parents take quite an active role in raising the youngster. Oh, it's really nicely tucked up in there now. Let's have a look. I just saw that little lapwing actually scurry under the adult. Come on, be proud, show us your baby. See, that call is very, very different from that incessant tinking we got on the Sunrise Safari. Now, can you believe that we don't even know there's a baby there? And if she was to be disturbed, quite often that baby would instinctively just stay flat. So you, uh, any pre potential predator would just think she was having a rest on the mud. Now... One of the biggest threats to those little lapwings, specifically this lapwing, because not many terrestrial predators are going to be able to get out onto that mud without sinking through. It'll be an avian predator. Fish eagles will take baby lapwings. Any of the little goshawks or sparrow hawks. African hawk eagle. Okay, well, we'll leave the little blacksmith family. And that's so incredible. And if you look closely, there's so much to see out here. And speaking of some of the little things to see, James has got a very brightly coloured little thing to show you. I have to say, I think this might be my second favourite bird, everybody. It is the crested barbet. And look at it. It's beautiful colours. Ridiculously scruffy and surprised look. Uh, it's got a sort of surprised yet determined look about it, I find. And he's looking for some fruits to eat. That's what they like to eat with that big heavy bill of theirs. But they'll take anything they can get at this time of the year. <laughs> and, I mean, again, just try and appreciate the coordination it took for that little thing to stand on one leg on a swaying thorny branch and scratch the back of its ear with that incredible dexterity and speed. Isn't he amazing? And I think the reason he's my second favourite bird is for much the same reason that the robin's my favourite bird here. You do get these things in town, and I've spoken about the fact that they used to fight over a piece of pawpaw that I'd put out for them when I lived in Johannesburg. There was a little touch of the wilderness there in the midst of the city. He's a fantastic fellow. I 
think what he's doing is uh, possibly looking for insects. This time of the year, probably ants and termites quite a lot. And as I was saying this morning, and I'm not sure I got to complete it entirely, Brian was pointing out to me how many insects have got into um, have got into the lights above our workshop, and you don't see a lot of. I mean, you really don't see a lot in the way of insects at this time of the year, but they're obviously around. And I think that's what this fellow is being forced to eat. He'd far rather have bananas and pawpaw. But uh, this time of the year, not many of those around. Beautiful thing. They also nest in tree holes, just like those um, lilac-breasted rollers we saw a little bit earlier. And the tree he's sitting in, we don't often get a look like this, is called a black monkey thorn. And if you look at the thorns, you can just see they've got a black tip to them. No, not a black monkey thorn. What am I talking about? They're called a... Oh, goodness gracious, I've lost it completely. Black. Mo it is black monkey thorn, yes, a black monkey thorn. <laughs> it's getting confused between that. And thank you for all of your screenshots. Apparently they're really impressive. We'll thank Brian for that. I think he's a remarkable fellow and I'm astounded that he doesn't um, leave us. Now, I'm going to be a little bit naughty, everyone, and I'm going to see if I can make him call for you because he's got such a lovely call. And I say a little bit naughty because we don't want to freak him out at all and make him think that his territory is full. So I'm just going to give a very short burst of his call. That'll do. See him looking up in deep confusion. I just want him to try and do it. Because it's so funny when you see them calling. <laughs> He's not fooled. This might be the greatest, um, the greatest crested barbet sighting in history, Brian. Yeah. And the best thing about it, Brian, is that he hasn't voided his bowels like most of the birds do when we look at them. Not yet. Not yet, yes. I suppose it is early days. <laughs> that is really tempting fate, wasn't it? Every time he now flicks his tail, I think, oh, oh. There we go. You can see the breeze blowing, sort of swinging the tree a little bit. But he's holding on just fine. And if you're wondering how it is that they're able to hold on like that, it's, it's because... <laughs> Kim, Kim, you've asked a very difficult question. I will attempt to answer it uh, by cheating and looking at my bird app. You want to know how many bir eggs they, they lay? Kim Kim, I'm going to say two, and then I'm going to read. Breeds in hole in excavated underside of dead stump. Yes, blah blah blah. We know that. Hang on a second. I've got to go down to the more, uh, to the more um, detailed. We go two to five, usually three to four, laid in 24-hour intervals, uh, and they live. I'm not sure how long they live. You'll probably find they live about 10 years. They probably start breeding in their second year or so, so I suppose they would lay, well, I guess, eight times four eggs, which would be 32 eggs in a lifetime, plus minus. I'm sure there's, a, there's an enormous variation there. And, you know, I'm always amazed when I read these accounts, I'm always amazed by how short the incubation period is. This incubation period is only 17 days. That's just over two weeks it takes for the little hatchling to come out of its eggs. Isn't that amazing? And the other thing, sorry, I was just trying to tell you before I answered Kim's question. You see how he's sitting there, he looks very comfortable of course, and he's swaying in the wind. There's no effort for him there, he's completely at rest. He's not holding on like you and I would have to hold on were we hanging from a tree uh, that size, uh, swinging in the wind. As he sits down, his 
claws or his feet immediately closed because of a tendon between, well, if you imagine that a tendon between your thumb and your forefinger, something similar to that. There's a tendon there that immediately snaps those toes closed in a sort of vice-like grip, so he's completely at rest there. Otherwise it would be impossible. So he's not using any muscles to hold himself on that. <laughs> Look at him looking at us. <laughs> Joanne, you say you love the pretty red on the bum. Yep, I quite like it too. I, I particularly like the red around his face actually. That's my favourite bit. And the first time I ever came across this special bird was when my brother's cat, Miss Brown, a recalcitrant Burmese, caught it and brought it into the house very proudly, at which point we all discovered exactly what a crested barbet looks like. And I seem to remember thinking, what a scruffy bird. Now this was at a stage of my life when I couldn't identify the difference between a grey-headed sparrow and a martial eagle, and yet it wasn't in fact the attentions of the cat that had made the bird scruffy, they are scruffy by default. The bird didn't make it I'm afraid. I think it went down the loo, sadly. It may have been buried, no, I think, I think it was buried actually. There may have even been a small epitaph written. Well, Brian, I think this is the first time we've ever been outweighted by a crested barbet. Indeed. Hmm. <laughs> this is before we link to Steph, who is still making his spoon. Um, I just want to quickly tell you about... Um, something that's making me giggle. Um, Kirsten, if Steph is desperate to tell you about his spoon, immediately let me know and I shall link him quickly. Um, we had, as a family, we, had, we kept birds. Well, my brother kept a bird, he kept a budgie. And then we had some love birds and we got some bad advice and we put them all in the same aviary. And the budgies bred really successfully, except that the lovebirds didn't like them very much. And so uh, they were quite vicious with the budgie, budgies. And we were disastrous at keeping these things. And they kept, they kept dying, uh, mainly because they were attacked by the lovebirds. And so we'd first few times there were great tears and we'd bury them and put up a little epitaph or some kind of wooden cross nailed together. And... Um, <laughs> This went on for years until um, eventually my brother and I left home and uh, my sister was still at school and so it came to her to look after the birds. I'm not sure why we still had birds at that stage, but we did. Um, and apparently it's, it's just recently surfaced in the family that my sister used to go into the aviary in the morning and if she found a corpse, she would take it out and instead of burying it and putting an epitaph, she'd just toss it over the neighbor's, uh, over the neighbor's wall. and. We were wondering what on earth the neighbours must have thought when they kept finding bird corpses on the, their side of the fence. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm not sure if you found that funny. I still find it terribly amusing. Let's go across to Steph and find out about his spoon. <laughs> that thing is still there. All right, now, <laughs> I actually have been quite busy with my spoon. I must be honest with you, I haven't moved from this termite mound since, since we've, uh, we've, uh, we've plucked it. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, I salvaged a piece of wood from an elephant-damaged tree. And although this may not look like much, the spoon that it is, is taking shape. There you have it. Now... While I thought that it would be a stew ladle when I first started it, it's now turned into a teaspoon, as you can see, with me busy with. And I've actually got an idea for the spoon. My son is an avid yogurt lover, and he eats probably about three or four little tubs of yogurt every single day. I'm going to give him this spoon as a present when I get back home on Friday. And, uh, and this is going to be my gift to him for, uh, for the spoon. It's even got a handy little hook that he can put on his 
on the side so we can dry it or hook it on. There we go. Hold it. I'm still busy finishing it off. But that's my apple leaf spoon that I've got for my little boy. So, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Bushman, for, uh, for helping me there. You can ladle it into mouth. So I'm going to carry on walking now, now that I've got the basic shape that I've got going. I might round it off a little bit more there at the front. I'm still deciding on how much to take off. Give it a little bit more of a rounded shape. But on all in all, I think that's, that is what this piece of wood has called to me to do. All right, and on we go. Let's carry on going here. I want to head for that jackalberry that you can see in the distance over there. And the reason for that is that it is looking quite spectacular. I'm almost expecting a, uh, a what do I say? I'm almost expecting there to be a nest in there of some sort. Let's carry on going. I've actually lost my swagger stick, which is a pity. So anyway, we'll have to whittle another one as we go along. I had a bat in here. I was feeling quite out. Brent and James both have these enormous pieces of wood that they walk through the bush, swaying to and fro. And I had to, uh, I had to get myself one. And uh, I feel quite naked without it. I know what, now why they, why they have it. Watch out for these thorns here, Xander. They are quite vicious. Have a look at these thorns here. They, if you're not careful, can definitely take out an eye or two. While we thread our way through here, on our way to that tree. <laughs> Xander's wires keeping him. Right, right, let me get in your hand. See, that's why I have a swagger stick. I can push these things out of the way. You're all free, all good, done. <laughs> all right, this way. It's like a bit of a maze out here to walk through some of these bushes, I must be honest with you. We're still heading to that tree in the distance. Let's carry on going. Oh, this landscape is just absolutely blasted. Now, while I was just going to be, I was just actually going to talk about the drought, actually, Michael has asked me how much rain will it take to end the drought. Now, Michael, we have probably around about 400 to 600 milliliters of rain here a year, which is about that much. Now what that means is the ground will be saturated to that deep. That's what 400 millimeters of rain means. The ground is saturated to this deep. Um, and to break this drought, I would say to give us the reserves that we had, you're probably looking at about a meter. I know that the 90s drought that we had in the 1990s was very, very bad. And it ended just before I became a field guide in about 1998 with the end of the very dry period ending in about 1996. We had a wet year 96, but it only really replenished stocks again in about the year 2000. And then it got dry again from the year 2000 to a, a peak at about 2009. And then 2012 and 13 were a wet year. And now we're in 2016, incredibly dry year. So I don't quite know, you know, we're looking at it over a very short space of time. To answer your question simply, I think we're going to need about a meter of rain. So probably about that much to break the drought. As to if we're in a 100-year dry cycle, a 1,000-year dry cycle, a 100,000-year dry cycle, who can really tell? I don't really know. I don't think anybody could really know. It's a bit of a, an educated guess. But we should see a change here, Michael. If I were to suggest something, take a screen grab of this right now. And I guarantee you, by the time Christmas comes along and we have our Christmas shots, this that you're looking at now, we won't be able to see one little piece of brown. That's my prediction. Not even one little piece of brown in this whole landscape will you be able to see in December, January. See if you can hold me to my word. All right. Now, while we make our way through to that tree there in the distance, we've got Brent who's waiting to give you an update. So we've circled the area where those last lioness tracks were going and unfortunately they haven't come out of that block so I think they're somewhere relatively close to the cubs snoozing, maybe taking a break from being jungle gyms and biting toys and uh, I'm quite sure hopefully they will move back towards them later or otherwise during the night. So what we're going to do is I've heard a report of a nice herd of elephants uh, to the west of us and uh, I do have 
ulterior motive for going there. About 500 meters away from where the elephants are, are a sleeping group of my favorite animals. Unfortunately, they are outside of our traverse zone for now, but those of you who watch regularly will know my favorite animal is the African wild dog. And uh, they are, we are getting at about the time of day that they are likely to become highly mobile. So we want to position ourselves to be in the general vicinity uh, of those wild dogs in case they do decide to come south onto Juma, which is very exciting. I could not think of a better way to end the day. I mean, lion cubs, wild dogs. I mean, you just don't get much better than that. And let's throw some elephants in, in between. Now, what I was saying, quite often we track for a long time and we're looking around, but there's literally anywhere we stop, there is going to be something interesting uh, to chat about or to look at. And I said, there's a little experiment. I'm going to say, why don't you guys? And so, as I said, it's not set up. I'm not going to ask them to ask me about something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop when I get five tweets or five emails saying stop. And if you want to say stop, you know, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. And my challenge then is to find 10 interesting facts within 20 meters of the vehicle uh, to show you. So quite, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, a very good friend, a family friend of ours, uh, who owns safari companies up in Zambia, his guiding job interview, which I think is possibly one of the best guiding interviews uh, that I've ever seen, is that he will take a, an interviewee out onto the bush like this, and he'll stop here, and he'll give them 50 meters and 15 minutes to bring him 15 interesting facts. But while we look for a spot to stop, James has got a very interesting creature having a drink. This is very cool, everybody. It was having a drink. Unfortunately, it seems to have stopped having a drink now. Um, that's because giraffe don't drink for very long. Let's just keep an eye there. Yeah, it might go back again. Beautiful sight though. The light is just so beautiful here. There are two of them obviously They were both drinking and now not so much anymore, but that's okay There they go together Now those lions are somewhere that's in Mala Mala we're looking at everyone and so the sticks pride went in there at some stage yesterday evening It's a rather splendid sighting, I think. Unfortunately, they seem to be Mala Mala giraffe, which means they're not coming this way. And you can maybe hear that southeasterly breeze blowing gently. Oh, I'm having a bit of a bite to eat there. Of Acacia gerardii, the red thorn. I took quite a nice picture, Brian. I might show it to you once we've finished looking at that giraffe. Unfortunately, I mean, it's really rather irritating that they're going down south into Mala Mala there. Infinitely preferable where they're going up north into Cheetah Plains. Hello, Brian. Nice to hear from you again. You are wondering about their teeth and whether they have similar kind of arrangement to elephants. Now, elephants, for those of you who don't know, get six sets of teeth in their life, six sets of molars. Eventually, that last set wears out and the elephant will kind of starve to death. Uh, it's not a very nice way to go, but it's better than being killed by lions. Then, Brian, you want to know if any other animals have that sort of situation? No, they don't. 
just about every single mammal I know of will get two sets of teeth, the milk teeth and the of adult teeth. But I don't know of any other mammal that has the same arrangement as the elephant. That is quite extensive thicket there that's in the middle of that clearing and I'm going to address it with my binoculars and see if I can see what tree species has formed that rather vast thicket in which if I was a lion I would be hiding. Seems to be quite a lot of quarry and maybe some saffron. Hmm. Hello Tony. While we watch that giraffe eat and swallow into its first stomach, you want to know where the food goes from there and how many stomachs it has. Tony, it's a ruminant, so it has four stomachs, uh, the names of which I cannot remember. But the first one, the food goes in and it sits upon a sort of, a, uh, I guess, a liquid, liquid sludge. And then it is regurgitated into the mouth and then re-swallowed into the rumen, as far as I'm remembering. Oh, it was the first bit, the rumen. I'm not sure. Anyway, it gets swallowed, and then it, the real process of fermentation begins in the rumen, as far as I remember. And that's where the finely chewed particles from the second chewing go. And that's where the bacteria in the rumen digests the food, or sort of breaks it down. Then it passes through the next two stomachs. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's coming back to me. The omason and the abomason. And those two parts of the stomach, I think, absorb the nutrients that have been um, broken up and sort of extracted, if you like, by the bacteria that are in the rumen. That's basically how it happens. So it's exactly the same process that happens in a cow. Ah, there we go. So it's the rumen. That's the first one. So the food goes into the rumen to start with. There it sits until the giraffe is ready to re-chew its food. So when the rumen becomes full, what happens is that uh, the giraffe will start to regurgitate. Then it will re-chew it. It will go into the reticulum after that, where the process of the fermentation takes place. And then it will go into the omasum and the abomasum, and those are the four chambers of the stomach. It then obviously has an intestine, a lengthy intestine, in the same way that we do, and lots of absorption that goes on there. In fact, a massive amount. Uh, in fact, much longer than ours, because any herbivore has got a much longer proportionately intestine than we do. Quite astounding, in fact, how much intestine there is in a mammal, or in any animal, really. Righty, Brian, shall we move on after that delicious discussion? Ooh, and Brent has managed to find something that I've been finding very scarce of late. So James has been chatting about ruminants, and here's the second largest ruminant we get. Now, I'm a bit confused, because the one who has her bottom to us is indeed a her, a, a buffalo cow. But all the others I can see surrounding us are buffalo bulls, which leads me to surmise she has been separated from a breeding herd, probably by lions, and has dis and been quite long separated. So she decided to team up with the retired gentlemen's club. And all I'm seeing is that we've got one. Let's start. We've got one old buffalo bull and two old buffalo bulls, and then a three and four down there, five opposite us and six seven eight behind us all buffalo bulls and one cow unless there's a breeding herd around the corner that I'm not seeing but even if I wasn't seeing them I would hear them a breeding herd of buffalo makes lots of noise that's quite a nice looking buffalo bull there a little bit of a glint from the sun off his massive boss. A little bit of a speckling of dust, I mean of mud on him. A 
very, 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 very relaxed looking buffalo. And that's probably because the Inkahumas are far to the east at the moment, but you never know, they might come this way during the night. And they have been hunting through this area quite, quite often in the last two or three weeks and tending to focus on these little bachelor groups of buffalo. Now this is the area where the elephants might be around as well. So while we're sitting with the buffalo, I'm listening to see if I can hear the ellies. Oh, what did you get a fright from? No. And keep chewing your grass. And you can see there's still quite a bit of grass in this area. It's right at the base of a seep line where all the water runs down into the little river system behind. And with that little bit of rain, there's quite a bit of flash. So the buffalo are actually munching away quite happily around here. But as it gets cooler, they're going to start leaving these areas, heading up towards the crests, the top of the hills. And on these cold nights, it's a couple of degrees warmer the higher you are in the low felt. Of course, if you're way up in the mountains, that's a very different story. But here, uh, 50 or 60 meters might mean you're a degree or two warmer. So I'm going to keep looking for the these elephants. Also, the wild dogs are just on that crest over there. So a good area to be in, especially as we're heading towards uh, dusk and the wild dogs are likely to get moving. Sorry, madam. She's not very, very perturbed with us at all. Let's see, we'll sneak around here. How's that grass? Is that good? Good, I'm happy for you. You look quite chuffed with that tuft of grass you've got at the moment. Now, she's probably, as you can see, I mean, four feet from me, and she's taking no notice of the vehicle. I'm just carrying on grazing. And uh, I'm going to let her graze a little bit along before I try to move past. Looks very, very happy with life. You can see her hips are starting to show a little bit there. Now, Dawn and all, actually, if we go back to her, her rump, now you can see she's losing condition. See how sunken her hips are there? Now that is a sign she is starting to lose condition. And that's to be expected in a drought. Uh, big herds of buffalo are, or, are one of the worst affected by drought. There we are, she's going to give us a, a pass. Now, Dawn and Aaron are wondering, has anyone found that buffalo that escaped from the Inkahumits? Uh, yes, we, Viam, were you with Jamie? Yes, Viam and Jamie found him on Arethusa. Looking a little bit worse for wear. I didn't actually see him. How is he looking, Viam? Yeah, Not too good. And hopefully he doesn't bump into that massive uh, elephant plains hyena clan. There we go. Bye bye. Bye bye, madam. Here we go, a nice little buffalo. A little buffalo segment. Now let's go find some Ellie's. Now, oh, bouncy, bouncy. Tasha's wondering how often do buffalo rely on water? Well, they generally like to drink twice a day, spe specifically the big herds, they'll drink uh, generally in the early morning and again in the late evening. So they are very reliant on water. And that's one of the reasons why the drought affects them. Not, uh, not is that there's no water available, but the distance, <coughs> oh, some dust, excuse me. <coughs> the distance between good grazing and water is, is quite vast. So they spend a lot of time walking and, uh, and, and that does severely affect their, their general condition. So I hope everyone's doing the wild dog mantra. They're just down this road. So we're hoping that they're going to come careering towards us a little later. But while we send positive vibes to the wild dogs, let's go see what James has got.
we've got a lovely, lovely wide, bir oh, not bird's eye, what am I looking for here? Fish eye view, I guess, of this incredible, incredible sky, including that funny sort of what Brian described as an oil slick there now passing to the left hand side of your screen. Here it is. And it was uh, just before you came over, it was it really did look like an oil slick in the sky. It had a it looked like this you know if you put oil on the surface of water it reflects the light and prisms the prisms the light and breaks it up into its different components that's what that was doing this is really quite amazing and that is not so much an oil slick as an incredible sort of array of clouds at different heights and that's the far west everybody the sun setting over the drakensberg mountains being blown that way by the south easterly breeze we've come through all the clearings the only thing we had of course were those giraffe that have absconded unfortunately into mela mela so we're now going north up the next clearings. There are some very, very angry blacksmith lapwings behind us going They were chasing a brown snake eagle that flew off. Alrighty. Here we go. <laughs> it is really quite an oil slick in the sky. Now, we want to peruse these clearings to see a little canid bump, perhaps, of a resting jackal. Hello, Kitra in India. I'm going to answer your question once I've given Brian the opportunity to show you the moon uh, beautifully framed by a dead knobthorn tree. You'll see that, Brian. You'll be so artistic. There we are. See how I stopped there, Brian, so that it would be uh, held in the fork of that tree. Yes, thank you so much. Kitra, you're wondering why we don't see more in the way of cheetah. Well, it's just because the habitat is not ideal, Kitra. It's woodland, largely. We do see cheetah on cheetah plains uh, relatively regularly, actually. There are two male cheetahs that come up and through these clearings into Torchwood and then into the clearings on Biffle's Hook, and then they sort of turn around and come back down. There have been female cheetahs and cubs seen. Uh, somebody posted the other day on my Twitter account. Thank you very much for that. I forget who it was exactly, because we often get asked if we see female cheetah at all. But largely, Juma and Arethusa and much of Cheetah Plains is suboptimal habitat for cheetah. Cheetah like these big open areas, but if they were to just live in these open areas that are on Cheetah Plains, of course, there'd be nothing for them to eat, because everything would just disappear. The moon is moving remarkably quickly. Isn't that amazing? You can see it moving, everyone. That is not the camera moving, it is the moon moving that you're watching. See how it's moved away from the stick? How cool is that? Brian is not moving the camera, so if you... If you think maybe we're playing a trick on you, Brian has no ability to move the camera up or down. And look at the length of the stick, it's remaining entirely the same. And see how the moon is disappearing to the top of the frame. That is quite astounding. One is mesmerized by the slowness of it. I suppose eventually it would become a little bit like watching paint dry. Maybe not. You think better than that. Watch it now, everybody. It probably won't be quite as good that we aren't zoomed in. But you can still see it. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. Um, one of the most important things we've done today, of course, has been to observe the carving and whittling skills of Stefan Winterboer. And I personally am fascinated to know how the progress of his spoon is going. Let's go and find out. I detected some cynicism there in James Hendry's voice. My spoon is actually coming along quite nicely. There it is there. 
you can see gracefully curved with uh, an attachment there to hang and then the cup part and the bottom there I'm turning it slightly through your hands you've actually caught me scouring the uh, the banks of this riverbed over here for some sandpaper raisin bushes which I'm going to use to finish off my spoon and while I'm busy walking I can talk to you a little bit about where we have been walking we've been following this drainage line now you know watching this drainage line which is this depression that you see here drainage line is an area uh, that's it's basically like a creek or a ravine that floods after heavy rain and it serves to drain an area of water now I know where the birthplace of this water is and it's literally probably in the direction of the Sun um, on the horizon so where you can see the horizon this is where this creek was born and it's born in a big field it's big parkland a big flooded marshy area that hasn't got any marsh in it at the moment but this big marshy area and then moves down into this depression and it's been quite amazing as we've been ambling along here to see how quickly how deep this particular ravine gets now in my search for some sandpaper raisin we'll be able to go down here and hopefully I can show you how big it gets now this particular drainage line system actually gives our camp some water a little bit further down probably about another 200 or 300 yards or so is Philemon's dip now for those of you who've been watching our program for a long time you would notice that there's a you would have noticed that there is a pump house at Philemon's dip which thankfully now has a solar pump on and not that noisy clattery listed diesel engine that we had there for so many years making that awful thudding noise throughout game drive but it's amazing that in about 600 yards in a catchment area of uh, roughly I would say I don't know 20 square miles maybe in terms of actual surface area actual catchment basin we managed to fill a whole camp full of water and I mean we don't use water I mean we use water sparingly of course but we don't use water all that likely now have a look at this it's quite interesting here we've got a story here yeah we have all these grasses arranged, arranged in an array a circular pattern around this piece of bare earth now this piece of bare earth is actually the entrance burrow to a termite colony there you can see they've mudded the termite colony up they would have been active at night and they would have been chopping off these pieces of grass and carrying them to the nest sunrise caught this which is basically a stockyard termites would have been going from all over the place carrying bits and pieces of grass to here they would have left them here and carried on again and other termites would have come out picked up the grass and carried them down so sun dawn caught these termites they then cemented up their hole but what is interesting is this here this here is the the dung of a dukop now dukops are nocturnal birds large nocturnal birds that feed on termites and what was obviously happening here is a dukop was standing right here feeding on the termites who then bricked up their 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 entrance to their burrow as soon as the sun came up and dukops are nocturnal as well Quite awesome hey anyway just my imagination drawing me a picture about what happened here last night but on that and you don't need any imagination for what Brent has got absolutely we're off to see some elephant so we were hoping for some elephant we've made our way towards Sydney's waterhole and we've got not one but two and we've got a big adult bull on the right and we actually saw him on the sunrise safari. It is a bit far, but I'm pretty sure it's our old friend Hole in the Air, who's known to misbehave from time to time. We saw him close to here on the sunrise safari as well. And then he's got a younger bull with him. Now, in East Africa, they often call a younger bull that's following around a big older bull an Askari, a guard. Now, when Elephant bulls get very old, sort of um, on their last set of teeth and, and maybe a bit hard of hearing. It's not uncommon to find sometimes up to five or six young bulls in their presence, almost acting as lookouts for them. And there's a lot of theories about why. And it's possibly that they could glean some information 
from those older bulls. Secret water holes or fruiting trees. You can see there's a lot of dust in the air at the moment. We are heading down towards the end of winter. Now look there. Guinea fowl. Now, guinea fowl, there are quite a big flock of them spread out through here. But they're all over, all the way, spreading from about there all the way to those two we just saw. And I do love their little calls. Now, in the dry season, they form flocks, sometimes flocks of up to. Oh, there we are. Yes, it is Mr. Hole in the Ear. I recognize the short right tusk, long left. So the guinea fowls, as I said, can form, form flocks on the high fault of South Africa, up to a 500 or 600. In the low fault, we don't normally get more than about 50 to 100 in flocks. But after the first rains, they'll split up to pairs, into pairs to breed. And uh, they're quite successful as ground nesters go. Now, Andrew is wondering how many animals are going to die in this drought. Well, Andrew, it, it, it's completely dependent. Um, we might get some early rain. I personally don't think so. There's a few rain bets going around in camp at the moment. Uh, VM says the 1st of October, I think you said today? No, I haven't decided yet. Oh, VM hasn't decided yet. Uh, James says the 10th of October, uh, I say the 10th of November, I think it's going to be very, very dry before we get our first major rain. But I didn't quite hear, but I think we're going back to James, that Ellie's about to disappear. And while that Ellie walks off towards the Manuletti Reserve, Mr. Hole in the Air, uh, James has got the largest spiral horned antelope we get here. Well, certainly the largest one that we get here, everyone, the kudu. That is the many cow kudus coming across the road here, trying to find nice little bits of browse for themselves to eat before the night time descends. And we were discussing the number of stomachs the giraffes have. Exactly the same system in a kudu here. Rumen reticulum omesum abomesum. This is a really beautiful sighting, everyone, of that kudu cow. Isn't she lovely? She's eating some jackal. No, she's not. She's eating some Combritum hereroensi, the russet bush willow. And there are some wonderful ox peckers on a few of them as well. Can you hear them? <coughs> Pulling the leaves off. And those stripes, we think, break up the outline. And Brian was just saying, you said this morning to me, Brian, that in this kind of vegetation, you find the animals disappear very quickly. And I was saying the same sort of thing. And you said even the white on a zebra almost sort of vanishes somehow. It's almost like an invisibility cloak, but only in this vegetation. And you can see there how that is the case. So much more camouflaged for the winter than they are for the summertime. When it's very green and they can just stand behind a bush in order to stay invisible. And in the background, the ring-necked dove going... And again, pretty silent afternoon, you know, very little in the way of birds calling. The laughing doves going. But 
otherwise all rather quiet on the Eastern Front. Right, Brian, could we doubt now? Let's go back towards the west. We're going to head into the sun now, pretty much following the route that we followed yesterday. And I'm hoping that there's going to be uh, the same wildebeest that we saw last time, just around the corner here in a clearing. And then we'll do one more trip past three in a row pan, see if anything's come to have a drink. I suppose it hasn't been very hot. And so maybe that's why we haven't found anything drinking at these pans, but it's a bit strange to me. Lovely to have seen those giraffe. Look at this tree. <laughs> Hello, Gracie, who is about to have a day that is going to change you from being Gracie aged 8 to Gracie aged 9. That's very soon Gracie. I hope you're being very good so that uh, when the change does occur uh, you receive many gifts. You say that you're very worried about the ostrich coming to collect me and run off with me into the bush when I do my little ostrich dance. Um, Gracie, we're going to hope that the cameraman will warn me of the ostriches coming towards me. Brian, you'll warn me, won't you? You see, they'll They'll sh and then I'll get up and quickly get in the car again. Now, this tree has been absolutely savaged, and what I would like you to take note of is the heartwood, which is that lovely red colour, and then the outer wood, which is a sort of paler ivory sort of colour. And I think this is a red thorn, an acacia gerardii tree, but what's interesting is that, I mean, I couldn't get into that heartwood if I wanted to because of all the thorns. An elephant's skin is so tough that it's able to walk into this and feed on whatever it is that it wanted to feed on and then get up again. There are some vicious, vicious thorns and an elephant is just unaffected by them. Hmm. These clearings are rather spectacular, I must say. But I mean, that would... That would pierce you down to, well, I mean, if I was to stick it in here, it would be pretty lethal, wouldn't it, Brian? Yes. No, I won't. I won't do it. But you're not trained for that. You're only level one first aid. Right, yeah. Hmm. This is a good, good vintage. It's just the right age. Hey, it's delicious. Delicious, earthy smell. You don't want it when it's just out. You want to give it... Probably a day early. It's probably a day early. You want it about four days old for the best. You will see that, everybody. Did you see that? Brian threw dung at my face. No, no, Brian. It would have hit me in the face. And then you would have laughed, and so would everybody have laughed at the fact that there was dung in my face. I bet Gracie wouldn't have laughed. She'd been very cross with you. Okay, let's go across to Steph and get an update on his carving. Thanks, James. My carving's going fine. My spoon is is achieving a silky luster and a sheen that I just need to get going on my... It is a yogurt spoon for those of you that have just been joining us. It isn't a soup ladle. It's a very elegant yogurt spoon that I've made throughout the day. <laughs> All right. Now, Andrew's asked me, is there a specific tree to make a bowl out of? And it's exactly the same tree. The apple leaf tree are fantastic trees to make some kitchen utensils from, mainly because of their silky smoothness and their lack of splintering that they have. I'm rubbing it on my lips and not a splinter inside until I burst into tears after the camera's off me. <laughs> but anyway, we've got such a beautiful sunset going on. I just thought that we'd share it to you. Standing in a pretty open area where we are at the moment. And for no other reason than just it giving us a bit of a vista, have a look at the beautiful colours that we've got going through the bush at the moment. Purples from the clouds and the whites and then this golden light coming from the setting sun. That front that passed through this morning has given everything such a soft light and such a soft, beautiful sort of, I don't know, it's just a very nice afternoon. I've just had a fantastic stroll here through the bush 
with Xander. And why we actually came through here, apart from just admiring the view, is because this stump caught my eye. There's a stump here of a variable bush willow that has been elephanted. elephanted. And what is quite nice about these variable bush willows is that old stumps like this have these hollow cavities in. And these hollow cavities are quite often the homes of some fantastic creatures. And I want to see if I can uncover one of these homes for us to have a look at without getting puff at it in the face. Oh, hang on. I think I was probably a little bit over enthusiastic there. But in any case, we can have a look for another one. That was fairly embarrassing, eh? And I didn't have my spinach there today. All right, let's carry on up here. Oh, look at what these elephants are doing. They, now, combretums are elephant proof to a degree. While this look may like wanton destruction that you're seeing in front of us here, it's actually just nothing more than coppicing. Let me explain coppicing. Coppicing is what happens when a tree is broken off and then it splits into two. And then it's broken off again and it splits into four or into six or into eight. And that's exactly what's happened here. This tree is fairly old, but every single dry season, elephant come along and what they do is they coppice the tree. They break it off at this level. They also break it off at this level. And every year more and more branches go. And to a degree, I actually feel that elephant probably farm trees like this. I know they do it to round leaf bloodwood, and they absolutely do it to these variable bush willows in this area. They don't kill the tree. The tree is relatively resistant to this type of feeding. And I think they do it because every dry season they come along and they get these sort of bite-sized chunks of wood. Now, what I mean by bite-sized chunk of wood, this is one. This is a piece of bark, or this is a piece of wood that has gone through an elephant's mouth, this side. And he's basically rotated it through his mouth to eat off the cambium layer, which is what you see over there. It is the bark and the inner bark of the tree. And that is exactly what these elephants are after. So I think they farm in a way. They do terraform. That's when the elephants sort of change their, the landscape to suit their own habits. And this is one of those ways of doing it. But you know, it is getting dark and we do need to get Xander back before his massive beard starts to intimidate any male lions that might be in the area. But we're going to take this chance to say thank you very much for joining us on the bushwalk this afternoon. Um, hopefully I'll give you some feedback as to what my son thinks of his new yogurt spoon. I've got a funny idea he'll probably just use it as a bridge for his train set. But nevertheless, we'll carry on with that. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for all your questions. And we'll catch up with you soon, soon again. Have a good day wherever you are. Not sure if I heard that correctly, everybody. Uh, Blake is going to use a spoon for his train set. Well, I mean, I suppose he's a modern child. I don't know uh, if things have changed since I had a train set, but I don't remember having a spoon with my train set. Do you have a spoon with your train set, Brian? Let's also hope that uh, he's probably better used at this train set because it means he'll get less splinters in his tongue, I suppose. <laughs> That was a rather good look at the sun, everyone. We're going to just go up to the pans here, have a one last look, and then we'll start heading west for home. Westering home with a song in the air. A Scottish song, that one, Brian. That's why I'm talking like this. Yes. Well, it's an Edinburgh one, yes. I mean, there are various ones. Of course, to someone from Edinburgh, I just sound like a total idiot. But to those who are not from Edinburgh, and if you say it with enough confidence, they think, oh, yes, that sounds exactly like an Edinburgh borough. As opposed to a glass wage and one, which is my trash as I listen to. You. you know what I mean, Brian? When you're climbing a taxi cab, better go use your spoon. It's left lots of splinters in my mouth. That's what they speak like when Glasgow, Brian. Sorry, everybody. It's that time of the day. <laughs> it's that time of the day.
I feel I lost control slightly there. There's nothing having a drink here. There probably were great herds of things until they heard um, Billy Connolly, aged 10, coming along here and they thought, to hell with this, we're out of here. Let's have one more look at the sun. <laughs> the worst part is that I'm sorely tempted to do it again and I have to keep stopping myself. Okay, now. <laughs> a question from a new viewer called <laughs> Apollo Above. <laughs> and he just asked, What is he watching? <laughs> Apollo Above. It's astounding time for you to have joined us. Um, I must apologise, I don't always talk in a stupid accent. Um, you're watching something called Safari Live, Apollo above. You're looking at the African sunset going down live over the western horizon. We're in the northeast corner of South Africa. We're nowhere near Glasgow or Edinburgh. And we've just had a wonderful game drive. We've been seeing bits and pieces, nothing major out here, some impala and Kudu and Nyala and Giraffe, and now a spectacular African sunrise. Apollo above, I apologise profusely that your first experience was of possibly the greatest idiot in the low felt, that being me. Let's have a look over there at a blacksmith lapwing, and it's making the tinking sound that gave it its name. Apparently that sounds like a blacksmith hitting an anvil. Uh, believe it or not, I've known blacksmiths in my time. These days they're called farriers. That's a very, very small hammer he has, if that's what he sounds like. Anyway, it's quite a nice name. Yeah, special bird. Brent had a, an amazing sighting of them, I think. Was it this afternoon? It was this afternoon. Of blacksmith lapwing with little chicks. I wonder if there are some around here. They're just talking to each other before the last embers of the day fade, and they'll go and find a secret spot on the ground to sleep. Now, unlike that crested barbet we saw, they cannot perch, these birds. They have to sit on the ground. They do not have a back toe. So they've only got three front toes which means they cannot perch on a branch, which I think is quite interesting. I'd feel rather hard done by if I was a bird and I had to spend the night on the ground and I wasn't able to uh, perch somewhere safe. That's probably why they're shouting, Brian. Yeah. Ooh, and there's the call. Just watch in front there. If you go wide, Brian, maybe we'll see it fly up. That's the call of the red-crested Kohan. And they do the suicide display, just not today. Sorry about that. Right, there's the sun set again. It's almost gone now, isn't it, Brian? It is really quite special. Let's stop and have a look, another look, by way of apology to Apollo above for the fact that his first experience of Safari Live was the greatest idiot in the low felt. Ah, uh, Brian, I think it's your fault. I'm not sure that I'm like this with anyone else. <laughs> They'll just be shock in final control. They'll be unable. In fact, we're not even hearing anything from them at the moment. They're just too shocked. I think they've probably left. But that is a beautiful, beautiful picture. in my mouth. Stop it. All righty, let's move on from here. <laughs> We've had a comment from the final control. They're a bit worried. They think Apollo above 
might have um, left already and this might be his last experience on Safari Live. Um, I'm sorry about that. Well, lucky he didn't see. Imagine I'd been doing that when Brian brought his suave echinoderm into the front of the lens. <laughs> then he would really have been confused. <laughs> ah, well, not many places you can. Uh, Apollo, Apollo above his back. <laughs> Good, Apollo above. Very nice. Thank you for telling us that we hadn't chased you away within five minutes. <laughs> Stay with us. There will be animals at some stage, I promise. <laughs> ah, marvellous. Uh, Steffi has now gone home to whittle away his spoon. And I'm sure Brent will be scouring the landscape, perhaps for a leopard. But this sunset that we're driving into now is just too special and it's cut up and sliced and beautifully sort of um, I'm not finding the correct verb here it's um, being what does a prism do Brian it's riff well no not quite I don't know never mind it's very lovely we get to do this every day so Apollo above Stick with us. You can see the sun set in the evenings as we're doing now, or you can watch the sun rise in the mornings. Oh, this is just gets better and better. Right, I'm going to keep staring very pleasantly at the sunrise, at least the sunset. In the meantime, I think my friend Brent's got something to show you. Now, the wild dogs apparently have very fat bellies and are not looking like they're going to move anytime soon. So what Vim and I have done is we've moved off to the western sectors of Juma. And fingers crossed, there was a report of shadow not too far from our western boundary. And this is an area she does like to utilize when she's on Juma. So if she has come east, I'm hoping we're either going to spot her tracks or her in this area. Now, of course, the other leopard we might see. Oh! Five people have said stop. Now, if you've just joined, we had to stop at the immediate five people saying stop. And I now have to show you 10 interesting things within 25 meters of the vehicle. Whoopsie. Oh, I'm panicked now. What should I do? Ah, we'll start off with a good old standard. Now, am I going to be? That's boring enough. Wait, I need my knife for this adventure, I think. Am I going to be as boring as can be and do something that every safari guide does and talk about how the gwari bush can be used as a toothbrush? I'm not. Mm -hmm. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into gwari bushes. So give me a second while I get myself a reasonable piece of gwari because we need something a bit bigger because we're not making a toothbrush but we are indeed making something and see how strong these bushes are and how easy an elephant makes it look Aha. so we have a decent sized piece of gwari bush now the scientific name for the nut oh not the Natal, the magic quarry which I'm holding in my hands here is Euclea divinorum. So let me just remove some of the smaller branches. We're not going to do it like an elephant with my teeth. We're going to need, going to need that one. So we'll just chip it there. And oh, we're not going to need that one. So well that is a bit long. I'm going to have to saw. It's a bit long. I think it's going to be a bit too, um, let me try to break it first. It's going to be a bit too bottom heavy for what I need it for. So there we go. I have a device 
Now, I wonder what this device is for. Uh, in this area, it's not really going to work too well, but the, the scientific name for Aguari is Euclea divinorum, and it is used for water divining. So let's see if we can find some underground water. So theoretically, as I walk over a patch of underground water, the stick should start pulling to the ground. Now, I have seen people do this, and I've seen people drill boreholes on that, and it works perfectly well. This is a bit of a bad area, because where all the quarries are growing, we know there's underground water. But there we go. Interesting fact number one, Euclea divinorum, the water divining stick. Okay. What else have we got? Oh, see, it's, it's so tempting to go into the, the safari guide cliches, the toothbrush and the spirit transfer of the buffalo thorn, but it's not often, and especially not now, oh, how brave am I feeling to get inside? No, I'm, am I feeling that brave? I am. Oh, and then I didn't get hooked. Now, of course, the, the buffalo thorn is actually a very a good source of food. You can use it in your salads. Although, I wouldn't recommend eating them in a drought. There's almost no mm, joy or moisture in that. So there we go. Fact number two. Fact number three. Mm-hmm. Aha. This tiny little plant here. How's that, Ben? Can you see it nicely? Okay. This is a little flower. It doesn't have any flowers at the moment. It's only got the dead sort of stalks from last year. Or, um, oh, flower casings from last year, which are now seeds, of course. So if I bring that, just the seeds a bit closer to you, you can see. Where should I put them? Let's put them up here, Ben, where you can see them a bit better. Now, they break up into these tiny little capsules that have got just the most tiny bit of fluff, but enough, even if I blow very softly, to catch the wind. I don't want to blow them all away. There we go. There you can see that nice fluffy, whoops, little capsule which the seed is encapsulated in, in. Now, the, so these seeds are used as wind dispersal. Now, the more interesting thing about the little plant that doesn't have an English name, it's called Walfaria indica, and it's actually quite noxious. So it holds hydrogen cyanide, which is obviously very poisonous. And the Acrea butterflies, which is my favorite family of butterflies, uh, when they're a caterpillar, their host species that, they, that the adult butterflies lay their eggs on, so the first thing they eat as they emerge is the Walfaria indica. So that's what makes the adult acreas poisonous when the babies eat the leaves of this plant that has hydrogen cyanide. Okay, well, well how many facts are we on? Do them three? Oh, you've lost count already, you know? Jim's supposed to be helping me. Oh, see, now I've already heard Steph's already done the gall wasp, so I can't do that. But uh, we have got a silver cluster leaf, or a terminalia. Now, very, very high in, in, in tannins has a slight antiseptic properties. So one thing you can do is you can use it over a wound, uh, especially if you get enough of them, you grind it up and it's a nice poultice over the wound. It doesn't actually help too much, but it does numb that area where there's pain. Now quite a few baby um, animals, especially elephants and giraffe when they're teething, will chew on that to numb their gums while their next set of teeth are coming through. What's that for? So we've got a double whammy here. We've got the flaky bark acacia, acacia exuvialis, and this is more a bit of fun than a fact. Uh, I really love that scientific name because I think if you ever had to dry, jump on or tackle one of these acacia trees with these massive white thorns for protection, you would have to be very exuberant. But what I actually saw here is a community spider nest. Now, this is the only communal living spider in the world and I'm trying to see is this one active sometimes it's quite difficult to see whether they are and especially at this time of the year I can see some little wing casings in here so probably active and a little nest like this can probably hold a couple of hundred little spiders and anything that comes near their home is a great 
thing for them to catch. So there you go, that's number five. Now, the most common sunbird we get here, and I just want to make sure this isn't one, because it could be, the white-bellied sunbird uh, will actually take over abandoned communal spider nests, and they'll make a little hole in it, and then they'll make a false hole in it. So there will be a false hole that a snake or something might want to go into, but then finds out it's a dead end. And just below that, a much even smaller hole is where the, the sunbirds have now hollowed out the end, end inside, and they use it as a nest. And there's already a nice one of these nests close to Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And it's number six. Now, still, the community spider is the gift that keeps giving. Now, certain of your small flycatcher species, in particular, uh, chin spot batis, will collect uh, the web or the silk from here and they will use that to stick on their little bucket nests uh, to keep everything together and then they'll also stick lichen leaves and whatnot to camouflage their nests. Number seven. Okay. Oof. Oh, it's not very smelly so and it's we've done it before too often. Let's look for something out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to avoid doing the stuff we do on every safari. Although sometimes it is a little bit difficult. Ugh. Now, you can imagine going to your local spice shop and getting something I'm not a big fan of. I don't know, Vim, are you a big fan? Oh, Vim, Vim doesn't look trusting because I haven't told him what it is. Give it a big smell. Licorice. Wild aniseed. Now, this is actually very good for cooking if you like aniseed, which I'm not a big fan of. It always reminds me of my grandmother. Um, on the farm, she used to collect it and she used to cook lots of different uh, meats covered in wild aniseed. Uh, my, my grandmother also used to eat half a kg of, or it still does eat half a kg of licorice every day. Number eight, two more to go. A wonderful little leadwood. And uh, definitely one of my most favorite trees in the whole of Africa, specifically the really massive individuals. And a nice, just little interesting tidbit about the leadwood. If we had to cut off a branch and drop it in water, it is so dense it would sink. So isn't that incredible? That's number nine and the leadwood to take it home with number 10. And uh, it is also, if you run out of toothpaste while you're in the bush, you can grab the guari bush as your toothbrush. And if you burn any leadwood uh, branches, it's got an incredibly high lime, lime content, which is very good for your teeth. And so it was traditionally used as toothpaste out in the African bush. So there we go. I think we're going to continue this random stop uh, on tomorrow's sunrise safari and sunset safari. It's quite fun and it makes us look a little bit closer uh, than always looking for the big hairies and scaries. So thank you very much for putting up with or, or telling me when to stop. And you guys actually chose quite a good spot because this is a, a quite a difficult spot. There's not that much around here. But as I say, if you look carefully, I'm pretty sure we could spend another half an hour scrounging around for interesting things to talk about in this area. But let's keep looking. One of the nice things that it did also give me the opportunity to use my ears. While I was wandering around, I was listening for any alarm calls that might lead us to a large predator. But I'm sure you guys cannot wait to get back to the highly entertaining and a very interesting James Henry. Hello again everyone. Um, I'm not going to be very interesting now because I've found something that I do not know how to identify. So I wondered, the first few drives that I ever did at Wild Earth I had the impossibly hard tree quiz which was never impossibly hard for anybody and so I'm hoping one of our viewers might be able to tell me what this is. I cannot find it in a book. I will turn it around for you so that you may see the back end of it. And it grows in a fairly thick bush you can imagine this sort of a magnified. And so if you know what that is, please let me know.
Now you might lose signal through here, but we will pick you up on the other side. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't work. I'm going to go quickly now, Brian. Ready? Oh, we're back. Well done, everybody. You stayed. Excellent. That's just a little small wanini. Nini. Again, that has no English meaning because it's not, in fact, a word in any local language. And we will now make our way back onto Juma and see what is there for the nighttime activities. I'll put my tree back here in case you are still wondering what it is. And it only occurs on cheetah plains. It does not occur on Juma, as far as I can tell. I'm sure you'd find one or two of them there. But it occurs in very thick stands on cheetah plains. Very nice. The sunset continued to amaze us. I took a few pictures of it. And then we decided that we'd head along. But look at the subtle result of it. I mean, that is just too much really isn't it? Huh. It truly is absolutely gobsmacking. <sighs> now take a deep breath in everyone. Now let it out. Now close your eyes and do the same thing. And what you can smell is a subtle potato smell from the potato bush, a very subtle touch of smoke in the air. You can smell the freshness of the cold front that moved through this morning, so there's a bit of moisture on it. And obviously the dust and the dry, slightly cinnamon-scented flavour, if you like, of the Cambritum leaves that are lying on the ground all around us. Just delightful. And we, as we drive past Chitra Chitra Lodge, we've just gone past there now, the smell of a wood fire. And of course that is the most comforting smell in the world, I think, at this time of the day. It means you're going home to a comforting smelling wood fire in winter. And in Africa especially, well, what better way to end the day than around a fire, telling tall stories the truth and veracity of which can never be verified. Let's just wave at these people in a friendly manner. Hello. That fellow seemed to be carrying a puppy. Did you see that, Brian? Yes. A, some kind of pointing dog. Yes. African wild olive, Miko, could be. Let's uh, keep that in mind. Thank you. First option, I'll have a look when I get home at an African wild olive and a tree, African, it could be. Yeah, let's have a look. It does look like olive leaves, I must confess. Maybe it's an African wild olive. Thank you, Miko. Anybody else have an idea? Come on, Raisa in Finland. Jeffrey, Texas. Ah, uh, Book Diva, you've solved the mystery for us. Thank you very much. You say it is Brian, eh? A branch. A branch. Well done, Book Diva. You are a rare find amongst dendrologists. Fantastic stuff. And we'll probably just throw it away now that we know it's a branch. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's the correct term, isn't it? A dendrologist? Yes, something like that. We are now going through the valley of the great Mluawamati, the fighting waters. And we're going to stay on the southern boundary here, and just on the off chance that Karula decides she'd like to come back north. Put some light on the situation. It is now getting dark. Always a good idea when you come past an area like this to look into a clearing such as this one. 
because in such a clearing you might find a female leopard and her little babies setting out for the night's forage. I know. Paul, it's very distressing to me as well. You say you haven't seen Karula's cubs for over a week and they must be getting very big. Well, they, I think they are. I haven't seen them. I'm trying to think if I've seen them since I've been back. I don't think I've seen them since I've been back from leave. And that's, well, Brian, that's almost a week and a, two week and two and a half weeks now. So, yeah, just over a week, just over two weeks, sorry. Addled my mind. So I'm not sure where she, uh, she must be on a kill, I suspect, down in Little Gowrie. Not a huge amount of game drive activity down there. And so I think she sometimes goes completely unnoticed. Same as Shadow. I think Shadow is spending a huge amount of time on Hoffmans, which is to the south of, or south of us and to the east of Arethusa. And I, you know, people go on there if there's a sighting, but I don't think they go and do too much tracking there. And I think Shadow's little Zara is growing up without us, which is a bit sad. Anyway, hopefully we'll spend some time with her fairly soon. And I don't know if you've had an update on Sindile. Uh, many of you, if you are wondering, should go and watch um, Geri Camacho's Facebook page. Join him, follow him. He has the collar. He's the guy who operates the collar on Sindile. And the last ping I think he had was at Londolozi, basically, which is seven kilometers down that way. So he is wandering quite widely. Let's go and find out what's happening with Brent. We're going to go to the end of this road and then head north for home. We're still in search of any possibility of actually any creatures. Now, uh, I am sort of meandering through this area because it is part of a female leopard called Shadow's territory. And her tracks were seen not too far to the west of us on the sunrise safari. So I'm hoping that there's a slight possibility she might meander to the east and onto Juma. But so far, no luck with any of the tracks, but it is just the most magical all of you with us. And also remember, if you do have any questions, ponderings or comments, please let us know. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. And also remember, we'd love to hear where in the world you are from. So even if you're just letting to know, say hi, it's Jendo in Uzbekistan. We'd love to hear from you. We are coming towards the end of the sunset safari, but we never give up, not to the last second. There could be an incredible sighting just around the corner. And it has been a fun-filled day indeed, and exciting prospects for tomorrow's sunrise safari, and with those Inkahumas all about on Juma. And hello, misters. Nice little bachelor group of impala. Oh, not such a bachelor. There's a single female. So that means there's probably a few more. Now, during the rutting season, you will very unlikely to see a female amongst a bunch of young bucks. She'll be escorted into a harem by one of the dominant rams. But outside of their breeding season, the, the rams are not nearly as defensive of the females, and you'll often find mixed female and male herds. Uh, hi, Leslie, who's uh, in sunny California. Leslie would like to know if the Nkuhuma ladies are out hunting and the Birminghams happen to come across those little lion cubs, what would happen? It's very difficult to, to say for sure. More than likely, I'm 95% sure that nothing much would happen. Um, they have met five of those cubs before and I'm pretty sure they will have some sort of inkling from the scent of all the females around that those are more than likely their offspring. But you never know with, with lions and particularly with male lions and as I said I've seen male lions eat their own cubs on quite a few different occasions. But uh, hopefully the Birminghams don't do that and 
hopefully all those little cubs make it through to adulthood. That would be absolutely incredible. Oh, checking a lot of these big animal paths as I go through here. This is a favorite area of a leopard to walk through. And we're at the right time of the day for the, the leopards to get moving. And it's one of, uh, it describes one of my favorite, or the, the word to describe this time of the day and my other favorite time of the day uh, is one of my favorite words. And I'm sure a lot of our regular viewers have heard me probably over, overuse the word, but it is such a fantastic word. I feel I need to say it at least 20 times a week. So this time of the day and also early morning from pre-dawn into dawn is called crepuscular. Crepuscular. And uh, the crepuscular wandering animals are often the most interesting. So at the crepuscular times, you're likely to find a lion and leopard and hyena out on the prowl, starting or ending their prowling. But with some of the other predators like wild dogs and cheetah, it is their favorite time of the day to hunt. And the crepuscular, I'll say one more time, then I'll stop, I promise. Crepuscular. Now, unfortunately, no leopard tracks on Juma today. But that's the wonderful thing about going out every day. And one of the things that excites me about sharing my African wonderland home with everyone is that tomorrow we might have leopard tracks everywhere. And we have lion tracks everywhere. And there's just a great excitement of things to follow. But of course, not always about them. There's literally a plethora of wonderful things to find out here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have a game drive channel blaring there in my ear. But I know I've got a question from Katja. Now on the Sunrise Safari I, I mentioned something uh, about the, the genetic strength and that's the passing of, on of genetic code. And uh, Lions and leopards have different strategies um, for the strongest passing on of the genetic code. And Katja is just asking me to explain that a little bit better. So if we look at leopards first, uh, the strength of, a f of, of that female's genetics and the, and the biggest chance for those genetics uh, to be passed on is through the males. So they take longer to care for the males. Uh, female leopards are generally independent as early as a year, but normally by a year and a half, they're completely independent from mom. Although young boys like to hang around for sometimes up to three years. So, and the reason for that is that female leopard, her genetics will disperse with that male and will be able to mate and spread those genes much further. Now, lions are, have a completely different strategy because they're a social animal. And if you look at uh, social predators, uh, and the two large social predators in particular that we get out here, which is the, of course, the hyenas and the lions, their genetic strength is held within the females. Now, there is obviously dispersal of the males, but for the, the best chance for their genetics to be passed on being a social animal, and generally all the females uh, in a lion pride in particular, more so than hyenas, are related. So there's that collective genetic knowledge so the, the 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 pride surviving above and beyond is the, the longest the, the way for that lineage of genetics to last the longest uh, with the female leopard she does ensure there's a good start for her for, for a female offspring sometimes not all the time generally a female leopard will sequest a core part of her territory to one of her female daughters but not always but, and uh, for that female leopard her genetics are going to go further uh, being a solitary animal with the males, where there is the lioness, their genetic pool is stronger within a group of related females. I hope that makes sense, Katja, a bit more sense. Uh, if not, feel free to ask me again, and I'll, I'll try to explain it in a different way. And if any of you out there are wondering how Katja got that question through to me, uh, it's by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or sending an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, 
the weather's been quite interesting over the last while. We've had strong winds and the cloud build up, but the cloud generally dissipates during the day. And I'm wondering what weather's going to be in store for us on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow. I'm hoping clear skies and uh, lots of fresh tracks. Now, VM and I are going to start heading for home. And uh, what an incredible day. And, and as I get, we're so thankful that all of you were able to join us for both the safaris and those on the Sunrise Safari were able to witness the first connection of the tiny Inca Hoover Cubs uh, to the rest of the Pride. And uh, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. Watch that whole process unfold. But it seems now already, in a few short hours, those young little cousins have already been accepted by the older Cubs, which is wonderful news. And all the Cubs are together while the lionesses are out hunting. But we can't wait to show you what's out and about on the Sunrise Safari. But I know James is just waiting to say he can say his goodbyes as well. So we'll see you soon. We are just, for the last few minutes, everyone, going to go past the Juma Pan and see if there isn't anything there. Uh, yeah, those of you who are watching it can probably tell me. I doubt there is anything, but we don't know where Karula is and maybe she'll pop out for a drink. We also don't know where all the lionesses for the Inkahumas are, so they might pop out for a little drink after a hard day of mothering. I imagine looking after that many children for a day would result in definite need for a drink. Hello Martin in the Netherlands, thank you very much for getting hold of us. You say this is your first time watching and you will watch again. That is a relief because um, of course Apollo above tuned in at a very wrong time when I was being ridiculous and I'm very glad Martin that we haven't managed to put you off either. Uh, yes, it's, I think it's a remarkable thing that we do here, I mean if I say so myself, this uh, incredible show of watching the world's most, one of the world's most iconic landscapes live twice a day. Well, I'm just tremendously privileged to be working here and of course to have all of you along for the ride. Let's go and have a quick look here. I'm really rather hoping Mvula and his consort will come wandering down onto Buyatela tomorrow morning. Suppose they may or may not, depending on how much of their impalas they finish. No, I don't see any lionesses wandering down for a drink, Brian. They must have gone to another bar. The lion bar on Torchwood, perhaps. Right, let's go up onto quarantine clearings. We'll give you a quick last look at the moon before we say goodbye. And for those of you who are new viewers, oh, there's a Nyala, panicked. Bye-bye. Don't worry. Uh, just remember, we do do this, of course, twice a day. Three hours in the morning, six to nine. Uh, three hours in the afternoon, six, at least three to six. Uh, that's why we're about to finish now. And that's Central African time. And those times will shift with the seasons, so they will get earlier in the morning and later in the evening as the summer progresses until very early morning, or well, the earliest morning as we start at 5 and then finish at 8. And in the off evenings we'll start at 4 and finish at 7. But that will only be in the midsummer. Right, we're on to these clearings called quarantine but that's the story for another day and we'll just get into a position where we can have one last look at the moon there it is Brian thank you to all of you for joining us today it's been a wonderful drive Again, Brian and I failed to find any form of big game, but that's okay. We had a lovely time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Brent, of course, in the other vehicle with Viem, and uh, Kirsten and Rebecca in the final control. Mostly to all of you, and may you stay safe and happy wherever you are during the course of the evening. And final goodbye to the suave echinoderm. <laughs>